Welcome to the first meeting of the Environment, Climate Emergency and Transport Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn off their cameras and microphones until they are asked to speak? And Vicky, could you do a roll call please to see which members are present? Yes, Chair. Good evening, members. Councillor Berry? <clears throat> Good evening, present. Thank you. Councillor Cameron? Hello, present. Councillor Corkhill? I'm present. Good evening, committee. Councillor Cox. Hello. Could could everyone else hear you speaking again? Then I was getting. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. Councillor Cook. Good evening. Present. Thanks. Councillor Fox. Yeah. Present and correct. Councillor Mus Pratt. Here. Here. Councillor Norbury. Councillor Norbury present. Councillor Irene Williams. Uh, present. Councillor Wright. Present. Thank you. I think that's all members of the committee who are present, Chair. Thank you, Vicky. Um, just reading out the webcast notice. This meeting will be webcast and a record retained on the Council website. For those at home viewing the webcast, I would like to inform you that if you look above the video, you will see a resources tab. Select this and a link to the agenda will appear in the right hand side. This will allow you to open the agenda in PDF form and follow the discussion and debate. Right, we'll move on to um, Item two, which is apologies for absence. We don't seem to have any apologies, is that right? That's correct, Chair. All the members of the committee are present. Thank you. And are there any member declarations of interest? Item number three, declarations of interest. Chair, um, if I could, um, it mentions by name uh, Magenta. I'm a non-executive director of Magenta Living. Um, it's the issue about round allotments. Um, I've taken the view um, and would seek advice that um, as a non-executive director, operational decisions of that level would not be uh, taken by me or, or a board level. So I'm, I'm, fairly relax I'm fairly comfortable with just declaring a personal interest on the allotments issue simply because it mentions the name of an organisation I'm a non-exec director for. Thank you. Um, Chair, um, a personal interest in allotments because I have one and clearly it feeds me as well. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Any other member of declarations of interest? No. And item number four is public questions and I believe there's no public questions have been received and no public statements to be made. So that would bring us on to item number four. Item number five, sorry, which is the Environment and Climate Emergency Action Plan on pages one to 24 of the um, agenda documents. And I'd like to invite Nikki Butterworth, who's the Director of Neighbourhoods, to introduce this report and Mike Coburn, the Head of Service, Environment and Climate Emergency, to provide a quick overview. Thanks, Nikki. Thank you, Councillor. Um, thank you. Um welcome all members um, I just want to introduce this report so this is the this report provides the committee with an update on the council's response to the climate emergency and on the emerging environment and climate emergency action plan which has been developed over the past year following the council's environment and Com climate emergency declaration in July 2019. So if I can now pass to my colleague, Mike Coburn, to take you through the report and the recommendations. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki, and thanks, Chair. Um, so in the um, document pack, you have um, a, an overview report and an attachment, which is a summary of the so-called Environment and Climate Emergency Action Plan, uh, the Emerging Plan. So um, clearly uh, you want to uh, ask questions on uh, the, the, the plan and progress we're making and the way forward. But I just wanted to quickly um, highlight one or two issues 
uh, for committee moving forward. Um, the, the recommendations, I'm assuming, Chair, we can come to in terms of uh, setting that way forward. So, as Nikki mentioned, um, the, the, the Council, yourselves, you declared an environment and climate emergency back in July 19, um, some 15 months ago or so. Uh, and I, I'm, I, I'm clear that we've made significant progress um, since that time, despite everything that is going on and the, and the water that's gone on the bridge, particularly this year, 2020. Um, there is now a dedicated climate emergency team, a small team, uh, to coordinate the plan, uh, but it exists and that is their role. Um, my title, um, as uh, Councillor Gray introduced at the start, is now Head of Service for Environment and Climate Emergency. So again, uh, we're setting out that senior officers have direct responsibility for driving the response to the, uh, the declaration you made in, in 2019. The, uh, the plan, uh, which is a summary of which is attached to your report, um, is a significant one. Um, there are underpinning the, the, head, the headings in the plan that you've got the attachment the summary there are over 400 actions uh, setting out how we will move forward uh, in response to the declaration um, they uh, cover a wide range of uh, headings as you can see in that summary document uh, and I'm going into more detail um, uh, in terms of the, the actions that we're setting and the progress we're making um, we are also establishing uh, a senior internal um, Environment and Climate Emergency Action Group, which is basically senior officers to be chaired by Nikki and, and uh, with the involvement of David Armstrong. And key direct, all directors will be expected to be members of that group and we will drive the actions in the Emerging Action Plan uh, through that. Um, there are some significant uh, other uh, achievements that we've made so far, which are clear um, actions within the plan. As you know, we set, uh, we, we, we launched the tree uh, woodland and hedgerow strategy in July. Um, they, there is a, an independent um, advisory board um, driving that, that uh, strategy. That's met several times. And we're also uh, accumulating funding for this year's uh, tree planting programme. And perhaps we, we, well, we, we will give you an update on that programme, progress against that strategy at a, at a future meeting. Also, um, the plan uh, sets out uh, a completely new way of working, uh, a new way of operating as a council. Uh, I'll be frank, prior to lockdown, some of those issues we were struggling to get traction with. However, as you know, members and officers, um, the enforced restrictions and lockdown meant that we changed our work and ways of working overnight. And things like use of teams, um, virtual working, uh, elimination of unnecessary journeys, um, becoming a digital council and, and dropping printing. All those things happen literally pretty much in the first week. Um, there is an opportunity through the council's recovery plan um, uh, it, moving forward to set a so-called green reset button to make sure that what we do, how we operate, where we operate from, and how we provide services, um, it, it changes for good and we don't return back to previous ways or certainly not, not all of them, not, not the inefficient ones. Another example of progress that we're making in the plan um, is uh, an area of procurement, which is basically um, the, um, the, the way we invest, the way we contract uh, and the way we uh, uh, identify um, uh, supplies, etc. We, I've met recently with um, colleagues from procurement um, to look at the actions of the action plan and to set out um, a way of operating. So they're already looking at what can we achieve quickly, what is a, a major challenge to them, uh, and, and what, what do we need to do moving forward in terms of training training officers, etc., to understand working with commissioners to design services, etc., for the future. So that, that meeting happened. The other positive news is, as you may have heard, there seems to be a range of funding opportunities that we can um, take advantage of. Uh, and we're investigating those those uh, opportunities literally as, as I speak, pretty much. Uh, the most significant one at the moment is a decarbonisation fund, which we seem to be able to bid for. And that could significantly help with us with our recovery plan um, and green, re green reset opportunity. Um, we're setting out uh, a commitment to be called something called, called, called a carbon literacy organisation or a carbon literate organisation. That means that 
significant numbers of officers and members have attended a formal training on carbon literacy and passed. Um, and we've started these courses. We had a, a pilot in July. We're, we're holding a course this week and we have courses running through the rest of this autumn and winter and we need uh, members on these courses. So we'll be inviting yourselves as uh, members of this committee, uh, spokespersons and group leaders initially to be on these courses with, with, senior, um, with senior officers. Also, uh, internally, this is an internal sort of arrangement, but basically there is a, a quality assurance process for reports. So before you receive them, there is a system where they're, they're, the, the, the reports are reviewed and you can imagine there's, there's checks on equalities, uh, the legal position, etc. We are now members, the climate emergency team are now members of that review and we review reports to ensure that um, the, the environment and climate uh, implications are set out in that report and you're clear when making recommendations at uh, what those impacts are. Also um, to shape the emerging action plan, we've been working with a number of third parties, uh, most significantly an organisation called Local Partnerships or a consultancy that works exclusively with the public sector. And they're working on helping us to shape our uh, action plan uh, and develop a roadmap that achieves uh, net carbon neutrality in 10 years by, by 2030. Um, their view is, and they've they recently concluded their work, uh, that our, our um, ambitions are achievable, but they do require change. They do require significant change in the way we operate now. But if we if we apply ourselves that roadmap, it is achievable. We're also working with APSI Energy, and we're members of APSI Energy. They're experts in terms of particularly energy consumption and green energy. Uh, we have we've had advice from Friends of the Earth. They've critiqued our uh, plan and given us comments. And we're also doing the same with the RSPB. Um, as I mentioned, uh, our, our proposal uh, in, in terms of moving forward is for the council to be net carbon neutral um, in 10 years uh, and following a roadmap to do so. Very quickly, I'm, I'm conscious of time, Chair, but just in terms of the structure arrangement now in place for us, you'll be aware that and you endorsed the, uh, the so-called Call cool Wirral 2 strategy, that's the um, Wirral second climate uh, change strategy. You uh, you endorsed that back in um, early this year and that's now fully uh, operating. That provides Wirral the place, Wirral the partnership with a set of objectives and a long term um, a target of uh, being net carbon neutral by 2041. So we're, our locally determined contribution to that strategy is our action plan and our 10 year journey to carbon neutrality uh, by 2030. Um, I've mentioned the declaration, you've, you're familiar with that um, and uh, you, 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 were, you were all keen to, to support that uh, re resolution. The resolution was quite prescriptive, clear, clear, clear things you wanted to see or you wanted to see stop or you wanted just to investigate um, and I, um, I think the action plan responds to that. Um, we also, as I say, established uh, the internal framework, the internal structures like the, uh, the senior officer um, action group to drive those actions. But what we've been advised we need to do, and that's the reason for the recommendations in front of you in the report, is that we need to develop uh, an environment and climate emergency policy, um, which basically responds to your declaration and provides the context and uh, framework or political framework for what we're looking to do um, in terms of responding to that declaration and, and, the, and the things like the 10 year journey to net carbon neutrality and, and being a carbon literate organisation. So the recommendations before you are um, to, to, um, to note the um, actions that we've achieved since the declaration and, 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 and are carrying on to, to do that, to um, uh, acknowledge and endorse the emerging uh, environment and climate emergency action plan, which is attached to your to your report, but crucially to establish uh, a working task and finish group to uh, develop that uh, policy. Uh, we're proposing that we'll uh, meet as a working party um, outside of the committee and then report to committed a future meeting, preferably as soon as possible, with recommendations for that uh, for that policy, and then potentially to take that to full council. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, know, I know personally how much work has gone into this um, and it's really good stuff. And I think it's important that um, members get to have a good look at it and get to see all of the, the policy suggestions. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to the working party fine tuning that. I think it's a, it's a really good piece of work. So thanks a lot, Mike. Um, any questions or comments from members about this? 
Christina. Yes, Mike, um, can I ask, when in the uh, recycling bit, um, how are you going to deal with the fact that there's nobody taking glass away now and there's nobody taking um, clothing and we don't have any facility for recycling um, material uh, fabrics because that's going to be a huge chunk and remembering that we were on I was on one of the task and finish groups with um, Carl Beer and various other people if we can get it all down we will save ourselves money and we'll also be able to apply for more money but this seems to this latest um, spanner in the works it, it, I think may be a problem I just wondered what was going to happen about it and thank you very much for the report it was very very good and thank you for all your hard work Mike Thank you, Christina. Um, yeah, there's two there's two uh, focus points to 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 to, to um, look at here. The climate environment and climate emergency action plan is the council's plan. It's it's the way that we're going to achieve carbon neutrality as an organisation. So the plan talks about our um, waste management. Of course, that has changed overnight or changed overnight with the lockdown. But moving forward with our with our assets. A key aspect of that will be how we manage our waste, how we minimise our waste. This is basically the, the, the offices and leisure centres and other things that we, that we that we operate from. So that's a key aspect of that plan. The point that you make is very much about the, the call to strategy and our work with the disposal authority and how we can maximise recycling, how we can reduce um, waste on a, on a strategic or regional level. And they are the challenges that we need to put back to the disposal authority. Um, the legislation on waste management is changing. The government's um, um, change has been delayed, uh, obviously because of COVID, but they thoroughly intend to introduce new environmental legislation, which will make it mandatory for things like weekly food collections, uh, but also to simplify and make more consistent, make um, the range of dry recyclers more consistent. So that's obviously going to help matters. But the issues you mentioned there about um, other other forms of recycling, like clothing and glass, etc., they they will all be picked up by that new legislation. Thanks, Anna. Thank can you, you very much. Thank you. Who's got their hands up, please? Because I can't see who's got their hands up. Um, Certainly, Chair. We've got Steve Fawkes, Chris Cook, Tony Cox, and Tony Norbury. Should we take them in that order then? Is that okay? Did you yep. say Steve? Chris Cook? Oh, sorry, Chris. Oh, hi there. Um, thanks for your very detailed and interesting and uh, encouraging report, uh, Mike. Um, just one point uh, about the carbon literacy course that I think just three councillors attended um, actually three months ago today, the two day course, 23rd, 22nd, and 23rd of July. Uh, even though that was only the prototype, you know, it was, it was really impressive. Um, and uh, I'm just a little puzzled as to why, um, you know, not even the, the members of this committee, given that we're up and running now, you know, the new committee, um, haven't, haven't been uh, able to attend that course, you know, in perhaps an enhanced form, one that's specific to, to, to Wirral. Um, because you mentioned how all the officers have had this training, or a huge number of officers. I think, I think in that very first training session, about there were about eight officers there. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's any particular reason for a delay in rolling this out. You know, because we've got to get all the councils on board eventually. You know, and and if we've only got two out of those present on this committee so far, um, with that behind us, you know, it just seems a little bit disappointing. Yeah. Uh, first of all, just to re-emphasise. That it is our proposal to you that the council should become a carbon uh, literate organisation. And that, and the, there are various strands of that: um, bronze, silver, and gold. Gold is that a significant amount of officers and members um, have that influence um, and and have had that training, and that is our ambition. So, as you said, uh, Councillor Cook, and you you were on the uh, the pilot or prototype course. Uh, that was back in July. Um, there, there have been some amendments to it because it, you know, it, it was the first of its kind and there's, there's more of an input from, from where we're on it. Um, we are holding courses, as I said in my brief input uh, this autumn. So there's a course literally uh, on, the, on the 5th and 6th of November. There's a one in later November and there's one in December. And through this committee and through democratic services, we want to invite uh, this committee onto, that, onto those courses. 
Um, we want to invite uh, group leaders and group spokes onto that. Um, the way we um, the way we the way we we, uh, we see it is that um, we won't be completed by this calendar year's uh, courses. We'll be looking to do other courses in the new year. But you're right. We need we need more we need more members on these courses, and through democratic services through Steve Fox's team. We will be inviting you on, onto the course. I know you've been on it, but your colleagues will be on on that course. It's crucial that we do that, as I say. So that's 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 our intention. Um, the course is admittedly designed for senior officers, and what we need to do beyond that is to develop some form of toolbox talk briefings for everybody else. So everyone will have a briefing as a minimum on carbon literacy. But the people making decisions and making recommendations for decisions must go on this course. So CLT. Uh, council senior leadership team, uh, the the the, uh, the middle ranking team, uh, CMT, those officers should be on that, but senior members should be on the course as well. So uh, we will be inviting you on the courses. The data set, um, and we'll, we'll be doing that literally uh, from this week. Thanks for that, Mark. I do have more questions, Chair, but I um, appreciate that there's quite a few other councillors with them too. So uh, would it be all right? Would you rather me wait to ask my subsequent questions on other issues until everyone else has had a chance. Is it on this item, this, this agenda item? It's not on this, no, it is on this item really, yeah, I've got quite a few, but um, I don't want to ask them all at once and, you know. Okay, well, we'll come back to you, is that okay? Right. Yeah, it's fine, thanks. Okay, so, um, Councillor Norbury. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, it's just one regarding the uh, waste authority uh, and what you said there, Mike, about the government um, implementing food waste um, disposal, uh, recycling, if you like. Um, I sit on the waste authority, and this is one of the issues that's come up. Um, and I did attend a, a conference in London before we were all locked down and what have you, when we were able to do that, um, and asked a couple of questions there, which weren't answered by the government ministers. And that's regarding funding um, for food waste collection. Uh, you will be aware that the council, we, we had everything set up to do a food waste collection and because of budgetary pressures, uh, we couldn't carry that through. Um, so it's fantastic that the government are um, implementing this, but I'm hoping that there'll be funding going um, alongside that to help our local authorities do the collection. Thanks, Councillor. Yes, um, as I say, so first of all, this legislation, uh, quite detailed consultations occurred already. So they had a long list of uh, ideas and uh, concepts that they wanted to potentially to include in the legislation. That was whittled down quickly. Uh, and they said, we're going to carry on consultation. But what is clear is that we want uh, food waste to be made mandatory. That will, that will be something that we're strongly minded to put into uh, the new legislation. So it looks like it's a, it's a, it's it's something that's going to happen. It, it, uh, the concept they're talking about is a weekly curbside presentation of uh, food in a separate container. The, the, there are four aspects to the legislation, one being uh, domestic refuse, so the, the issues we just talked about there. But there are other aspects, so there is going to be um, a, a, a tax on plastic or plastic composition, a deposit return scheme of bottles um, and a um, producer pays or, or packaging producer pays type scenario. The the idea, but it's not confirmed, and I presume you had that debate at your conference in London, is the idea that the income from generating for the, from the latter three will generate funding to support local authorities um, in, uh, in in implementation of food waste collections. The, uh, the time scales, I say, delay because of obvious reasons is that um, this legislation could be uh, realised by around 2023. Thanks, Mike. Um, I think we've Thanks. also got um, Councillor Cox. Well, thank you, Chair. You caught me off guard there. You changed your order. Um, I, I, like Chris, have got quite a few questions, but I'll start on the uh, action plan in particular. Uh, Mike, I think I, I sat in for uh, the, the, the late uh, Councillor Blakely on the last um, uh, scrutiny committee, and I think some of the some of the things that I'm probably going to bring up, I'm, I'm reiterating really. But looking through the action plan, there's some really good stuff in there. One which I um, do participate in is uh, normalising car sharing, which is I think is a fantastic initiative. It's something we've got in work. Um, Utilising public transport, uh, many of the members who are listening will be 
surprise to hear that I do actually use public transport quite often. It's not just vehicles of my own. Um, and uh, given the opportunity, I would rather use the train all of the time um, and never have to drive again. But unfortunately, some of us have no choice because of uh, we don't start work at nine o'clock in the morning and finish at half five. We start at five o'clock in the morning uh, when there isn't any public transport to get 40 miles to the other side of the river. So that was something we need to all, we, this is on the bigger picture, not just Whittle. This is now the 2040 target for the whole of Whittle being um, uh, carbon neutral. We need to uh, have, uh, have a handle on the fact that there are still going to remain always journeys that you will never be able to do without a car. It's that simple. And we need to uh, have a handle on that rather than, I think I brought this up on Monday night, rather than coercing people out of cars or forcing them out of cars, we need to bring them with us. And that moves on to um, active tra uh, travel and our uh, communication strategy because uh, and one of the things that's mentioned in the report is the importance of communication and uh, uh, engagement now the the, the uh, one of uh, again one of the other programs that we've actually had uh, that's mentioned and it did take place this year which is the grass verge program the revised grass verge program and it's not something that i'm particularly against uh, with cutting around the edges and having um uh, central areas where we have uh, the potential for wildflower meadows etc that's uh, i think it's a good initiative but clearly no one knew about it in the public uh, domain because the amount of emails that I have had and phone calls shouting about the grass not getting cut properly, uh, and I'm sure other members must have had the same. So something is failing uh, quite severely in our communication strategy, and that does tie into what we're trying to do. If we're going to have more active transport, um, the only way is to bring people along with us, otherwise it just will fail. It's that simple. Um, you can touch on some of them on the communications, Mike, but the other one was uh, electric vehicles uh, is in there. I have not heard members or officers talking about electric vehicles at all. Right? I've heard you talking about walking. I've heard you talking about cycling quite a bit, actually. Uh, I've not heard anything about electric vehicles. I do know we missed out on major funding a couple of years ago that we could have taken from the uh, government with regards to charging points. Um, and if we are going to have any sort of progress in electric vehicles, and my employer is uh, putting a lot of money into electric vehicles, but there needs to be the infrastructure there within the Whittle in order for us to be able to do that. What are we doing on that? And the, 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 the last thing, actually I may as well throw it out, it was to do with food waste. Um, the, uh, it, the, we did actually have, I don't know whether anyone else was in the trial. Well, I still lived in Heswell at the time, and it was one of the areas that trialed it about maybe 15, 20, 15 years ago. Um, and uh, it wasn't a big issue to me, but at that point in time, you had a caddy that it went into maybe in the kitchen for argument's sake and then into your garden waste. Now, I don't know what the proposals are, but clearly I've just seen a hole in the proposals if that is to be it again, in the fact that not everyone has a garden waste. Uh, been now, me included, I might add, um, and, that, and that's that's not because I don't believe in re recycling garden waste. It was because I refused to actually pay it because it should be part of the council tax if we're going to do it, rather than it being an additional charge. Um, but yeah, what what's the plan around that as well? If that's going to get introduced, because I think it is a good uh, proposal as well. By the way, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Councillor Cox. Uh, uh, quite a few things there. But I think the, the first point you made in terms of uh, car sharing and public transport, etc., it was really, you, you, I think you were building up to the fact that there's a, there's a massive challenge in terms of communications. This is all about behaviour change, isn't it? And winning, winning hearts and minds, convincing people that there is an alternative way, alternative way and they can make a difference and they can do something. So I take on board that the, the, there is a, a comms package, a comms strategy with this, which is obviously integral to what we do. We need to, we need to bring people along with us. There were, there were issues uh, inevitably during the uh, the summer lockdown, um, the lack of planned maintenance uh, and the pilot on on, uh, on on pollinators and somewhere on the line. It worked in parts, in other parts, people got confused to what, 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 what was going on and why it was doing that. And uh, we were determined to carry that on and, and to make this uh, something that we, we, we continue yeah. make and establish. We do, doing that, we need a commons thing and we need to make these areas much more explicit to what they are. But I think people are confused. Uh, as, you, as your lawnmower broken down, 
no, we were looking to do something different and to encourage wildlife and pollinators, which is popular. People understood it. But clearly there was, a, there was a message that we need to get across and we need to keep working that, to take that on board completely. And that is a, an ongoing challenge, which we won't achieve overnight. But um, but we, we, we it is a key thing. It, it, we stand or fail, I think, on the comms. It's as important as that. Um, E-vehicles, uh, vehicle in, uh, infrastructure for them um, is something that is developing quickly. Um, the, our colleagues in the transport team are overseeing that. You talk about the, uh, the, 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 the unsuccessful bid a couple of years ago when that we made more recently a successful bid for uh, for uh, charging infrastructure to go in so um ministers of transport committee as well so i would expect colleagues julie barnes and others to be able to come and give you an update on that which uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely a tipping point which we're reaching on that sort of stuff and happening now and that's basically in communal areas like car parks but also domestic individual uh, charging points as well so we can give you an update on that that is part of our plan um, and, and 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 our transport colleagues are moving forward with it. On the food waste, interesting uh, couple of points you make there. Um, actually, in 2006, garden waste was free. Um, it wasn't the subscription then. It was 2013 that kicked in. Um, the pilot, you're right. It was a pilot on peelings. It wasn't actually on food waste. It was peelings that went into your garden waste. I think on the west side of we're all West Kirby and, and how we like those sort of areas. Um, and basically, the peel was generated was found to have too much salt content. In any case, the infrastructure that the disposal authority had at the time wasn't continued, so there isn't that infrastructure to to carry on if we did that in the future. Um, Greater Manchester do that type of arrangement, so sort of food waste and garden waste in parts of Greater Manchester do go in the same bin, but that isn't possible here without a, an in, a investment in a major sort of plant. The proposal hit would be here is that garden waste remains separate, and the food waste you'll typically have a 50 litre um, bin at the back of your house or whatever to present the waste and you have a caddy in the in the house which you tip into the that, that 50 litre bin to present so that, that's the sort of arrangement that, that would work but yes the pilot in 2006 um was was just it was just a, a demonstration it was a a project that um uh, that we, we, we piloted not just here but but other parts of i think it was the parts of the uh, the region as well and, and we, we moved on from it Thanks, Mike. Before taking the next question, can I just um, point out? I don't. Julie's not here, so um, I think she'd she'd want to point out at this point that um, we have an OLEV grant, um, and and we did win funding for electric vehicle charging points, and they're going in across the borough, um, prioritising areas where we identified in consultation we identified a need a, a, a desire to have electric vehicles but no off-street parking so that they're, they're on street charging facilities going in uh, and that's happening now that's actually um going ahead we got the funding that was very successful and we're going to try and roll that out further so that's just to answer that point and i'm sure julie would elaborate um next time if she can so the next I can, I'm struggling to see hands and everything else on the screen, but I think we've got Steve. Is that right, Councillor Fats? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, Chair. Um, I think the temptation tonight will be to try and run out policies or ask questions about individual policies. And to be fair, this committee will only be meeting four times this year. Uh, so, which brings me on to the way forward, really, which is within the recommendations. Uh, my view is that, you know, there are some great ideas will come out from individual members, but there needs to be a more regular group. And I've seen uh, environment and climate emergency in, in on the very same subject be used as a reason for doing something. And I've also used climate emergency on exactly the same subject be used for not doing something and I think there really does need to be a clarity of policy about what what we're about um, and where we want to go forward, uh, which brings me on to uh, what I believe we should do in terms of the uh, task force or finish uh, task and finish group, uh, members working group. I think that will be a busy committee, um, a busy little group, and we'll be able to feed back to this because there's a, a mountain of work to do, you know, from from hydrogen buses to electric vehicles, you, you name it, there, there's policy lines. And I, I think we just need that that clarity. So my view would be that I know the officers, the recommendation from the officers is a group of six. But this committee reflects four groups, as I understand it. So my view would be that 
I would like to alter the recommendation or ask committee if it would agree to alter the recommendation to make that a membership of seven, which would reflect the uh, membership of the host uh, committee uh, and a political makeup could then be three, two, one, one. Uh, and I'm just going to put that as I have described in the uh, chat facility and just wonder whether that would allow then the the policy committee to have a to reflect the host committee and do some really valuable work for us to then um accept or reject or or improve or add value to as it comes to the host committee so that would be my uh way of going forward it, it if everyone asks 30 questions tonight we'll be here till midnight and i don't think that's a practical way forward thank you chair Thanks, Steve. I, I, I agree with that. Is there anybody, are you proposing that we change the recommendations then? So that would be, we accept the recommendations and we changed simply the line with a membership of six, or are you? Only number three, that would be altered in terms of, yeah. of being so it's just, I don't just, know what other members think. So. So just to clarify, it's deleting the last section of, of point number three, which is just the membership of six. So it's accepting the recommendations um, as they're written, but simply leaving open the possibility of a working group with different numbers. Yes. Chair, yeah, if I may, um, I, I think perhaps uh, uh, jumping in before our uh, spokesperson actually gets the opportunity, what I would say is, so I think Steve is proposing to make the uh, working group politically balanced. Is that correct? Um, Sorry, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be misquoted, and I was anxious to put something. If seven, it's, I think it needs to be small as it can be. And if if you know, other committees have waived the political uh, the political ratio. I just think it would be fairer to reflect the host committee in what was going to be a vital piece of work going forward. Um, we haven't got an independence and you know the independents aren't, aren't on it but our host for example planning has got a subcommittee of six which i sit on which does reflect the host committee because that's the way the host committee is set up it, it, it's a, it's it i don't know you know perhaps uh vicky you could come in with their legalese but it, it is only a working group and as i understood in the past working groups could have different ratios of people but for, for my starter was a minimum of seven so at least all the parties on the host committee would have a representative it, it's as simple as that i've tried to put it in writing i didn't mean to confuse by putting it in writing can i just add something there sorry sorry vicky um i i mentioned a, a, an agenda setting meeting i actually feel that the move from cabinet to committee system was it's not just about proportionality in, in committees it's also about representation from the different groups as well so I just it would be nice to see as much representation as possible so i think that that's an other advantage of, of what steve's suggesting sorry vicky go on chair if i can assist um if this was a formal subcommittee it would have to be politically proportionate but as a working group it doesn't have to be so if the committee wishes it to be politically proportionate then it would have to be seven and that would be three two one one but you could just have a sub um, a working group of four members one from each of the political groups so yeah. it's so, a sorry, of Becky. A chair of, of, of a mate, uh, what what Steve seems to be proposing though is whilst it's not a bad idea because we're talking about taking things out of this arena the only issue I would have with it is that whether we're here till 12 o'clock at night with 30 questions or whatever the, what, one of the main um, areas that we talked about in, in coming to this system was for um being absolutely and completely transparent to the public now our working groups are not normally televised so the, 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 there are only so many decisions that you will be able to take at the working group level that will no doubt have to get pushed back to this arena anyway for further debate anything that is contentious will always have to come here um and i, I just I, I wouldn't want to um i wouldn't want us to look too opaque with things looking like they're being rubber stamped which was one of the complaints about the cabinet system yeah so I can just assist that the working group would not be able to make any decisions they would only be able to make recommendations to the full committee so the working group would meet in private 
but it would only make recommendations which would have to then come back to the full committee for decisions to be made. Thanks, Vicky. That, that makes more sense. So we, we could have the best of both worlds there. We can have the recommendations from uh, a very representative group and then we could have the full committee makes the decisions. OK, thanks very much for that. Um, so, um, Steve, you're proposing that and I've got in the chat that Christina is seconding that. Is that right? Ch Chair, I've got my hand up. Sorry, I can't see hands up. I'll try and see as well. I think, yeah, I think we also got Councillor Cook also wanted to add some um, extra points as well, potentially. Go on, Christina, sorry. On, on this issue that we're talking about now, I, I'd like to say, I, I think it's very important that all parties are represented in a working party because everybody's got something to bring to the table. And to exclude one party, I don't think would be fair because people, they have ideas um, they've got knowledge and it would be a great shame and it, it wouldn't be the way we should be operating if we didn't allow the people who have knowledge and interest to take part in a discussion. And as has been said by Councillor Cox, it, it comes back then to full committee anyway. So that I, that's why I'd said I, I'm very happy to second the proposal of Councillor Fawkes, uh, which is now on the table, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Um, I can't see hands. Is there anybody? Councillor Cook and Councillor Norbury have their hands up. Councillor Cook. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, for inviting me in again. Um, so my, my, my attempt at um, Setting an example by only asking one question at the beginning didn't quite go to plan, but never mind. I appreciate that. I'll ask my three very briefly, as briefly as I can. And can I also express my gratitude for the consideration of other uh, councillors on the committee for um, potentially extending the size of the working groups to allow uh, a green place on it. That's uh, most appreciated. Thank you. Um, yeah, my first question, um, Mark, I'll just mention what the questions are about. OK, and then I'll put them to you. OK, the first one is, is about officer reports referring to the um, the uh, environmental aspect of any decisions to be taken. Uh, the second question is about the um, the, the Wirral or Borough wide um, target for achieving uh, carbon zero by 2041. The third question is about home working. OK, so I'll come back to, to them to actually put the questions now. OK, just to give you a preview as it were. Um, now, the first one, but the, um, the officer reports, uh, I have been looking at um, officer reports, uh, making recommendations, particularly in the planning committee for certain building work to go ahead, new houses and so on. And I've been a little bit disappointed by the brevity and their focus on uh, the advantages of, uh, you know, making new buildings, new shops and so on, uh, purely in terms of, yes, well, the new buildings will be uh, more carbon efficient, more, more energy saving efficient and so on. But there uh, isn't reference usually to the downside of that, you know, the uh, the environmental impact of de demolition um, and, and so on. Um, so that's the first question, you know, perhaps the officer reports could be a little bit more detailed and show both sides of the equation, as it were. The second question is, there's a lot of reference to uh, our initial target, achieving carbon zero emissions for the council. Um, within its immediate own province, as it were, by 2030. But I'm a little bit concerned that there's very little reference to the, the broader target and the more difficult target of achieving, um, you know, worldwide uh, uh, carbon neutrality by 2041. So basically what I'm concerned is that, you know, we're going to spend 10 years largely focused on the, the target of 2030, and that's only 3% of what we need to do. That's the easiest bit, because we're sort of uh, talking to ourselves there, you know, um, uh, it might not be an issue without we're, we're sort of putting off getting to grips with the longer term more difficult goal of remaining 90 percent the whole borough and uh, perhaps leaving that a little bit too late you know a little bit like somebody somebody doing an exam question that's worth three marks and spending half the time on it you know and then question two which is worth 95 percent only spending half an hour on it that sort of thing you know to use an analogy sorry i'm a teacher um the third one about homework very brief for this one then I'll leave you in peace to answer. Um, there are references to the advantages of home working. Um, of course, we understand those, you know, less travel in this business. But of course, there is the 
negative side to that too that if people are spending all day at home they're putting heating on you know and has there been or is there any way of calculating the the overall benefits you know on, on the plus side of not heating up council buildings if you like against the downside of you know hundreds of council, thousands of council officers potentially working at home you know a balance and plus uh plus and minus account from an environmental point of view okay sorry to take so long but that's all my three questions used up all right thanks thanks council look yes i mean in terms of um report um writing the report reviewing and, and really setting out uh, the full um aspects of decisions being put forward we acknowledge that uh, to this point, um, there need, need more work needs to be done. And uh, I've already said in my brief input, um, well, carbon literacy is a clear uh, response to that. But also, um, we are part of the uh, reviewing uh, body that makes sure that we, we, the reports that now come have the sort of length, level of detail that, you, that you're looking for. However, in terms of um, the policy issues that you sort of implied on, I think that is for the working party and the environment and climate emergency policy development to be clear on, on those sort of issues what are the standards we're going to set what is the level of ambition that's the sort of thing we need to um we, ne we need to address in that in that working party um but making sure officers are clear about recommending uh, sorry setting out the positive and negative impacts and that's in terms of uh, car carbon emissions impacts of their recommendations for your decisions that will be set out that has been now being set out um, in uh, in reports and we, we, we're part of that group as I say my, my team are and we're already reviewing some of the key um, uh, re re uh, regeneration reports that are coming out uh, and, and subsequent to the recent Pollen Resources Committee. Uh, in terms of uh, rural strategy and uh, our own uh, plan well you know the rural strategy the rural um, core cool rural partnership is strong it's alive and well it's long term uh, some considerable time went into uh, developing that uh, strategy, including for uh, an open public consultation. It is what it is. It's set out. It's setting out how we're going to achieve that as a borough, as a peninsula. We are key members of that, of that working group, of that, of that steering group. Uh, we facilitate that steering group. Uh, we drive the actions within it. We have a, a borough-wide uh, focus and emphasis within it. However, um, uh, we also all members of all partners of that uh, group uh, it's incumbent upon them to have their own locally determined contribution towards those uh, standards and we are we're making no apology that the council needs to lead by example uh, and, and set, set its uh, own uh, house in order and set the example by achieving net carbon neutrality in 10 years which is something that our, our um, advisors uh, have said is achievable with some ambition uh, and the third question uh, yeah homeworking uh, it all it was it was thrust upon us in uh, in March. All of us, uh, we had no choice. We suddenly encamped at home with our laptops and our and our screens. Uh, it seemed to be working. Everyone everyone's happy with it. But hold on, not everyone's happy with it. It's um, some people are, um, are, are working from home by themselves. They're, they're lone workers. Um, it it isn't good in terms of some of the um, issues that we need to tackle as managers. Um, it's not for everyone, I suppose. Is what, I'm, what I'm trying to say. Um, and there needs to be a blended approach going forward in the in the recovery plan. In terms of the actual calculations of uh, energy consumption, etc., and the transfer from um, our significant savings, there have been significant savings since the lockdown, uh, moving to our, our workforce. Yeah, there, there needs to be that balance, that calculation, and we need to be giving something back to our workforce. And we're working on a range of ideas and and um, and and uh, issues that that could do that. It's not just the the, the, the small tax, tax rebate that people can get back from doing this. We're looking at um, uh, interest-free loans, uh, that type of arrangement, the sort of thing that we've done on bikes so far for things like home improvements and home insulation that would help employees. And we're actively working on that with our HR colleagues as we speak. But that's something, obviously, that we need to build into the recovery plan. The, the um, uh, home working, um, the way we work from offices, etc. The way forward clearly will be a blended approach. It will not be everyone's at home and that's it. It will be people can work from home where they can, uh, but we'll be providing office space and we'll be supporting people that are working from home. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Uh, were there any other questions or comments or suggestions? Um, Councillor Cox has got his hand up and Councillor Corkhill. Right. Andy hasn't spoken. Andy, do you want to come in? 
Yeah, thanks, Liz. Um, hi, Mike. Um, I like the report and I look forward to the policy sessions that some people are going to get involved in. I wasn't necessarily going to say anything um, this evening and on the it's a decent report and that we're going to, I guess, scrutinise as we move forward. Um, but as I was sitting here, the, the Liverpool City Region uh, overview and scrutiny agenda uh, was sent to me and Sorry. I just started a quick Andy. look. Can I just check if that's and my And one of the things that will come up over no, the is the LCR's uh, quality action plan. Councillor Corkill, unfortunately, the sound... For example, the rural air uh, quality... Unfortunately, the sound... Will that sort of... Well, will that like be to under the... the camera off? If you could turn your camera off, sometimes it gives a bit more bandwidth and there we might be able to hear you better. Oh, can you not hear me? No, not... not no, we couldn't hear you. You're breaking up there. Can you hear me now? That's better. We've all got cameras, our um, microphones off. I'm so sorry. I, that was such a long question as well. Um, okay, so basically the question was before it was about how, how our relationship with the Liverpool City region will look. Um, I, basically because um, in overview and scrutiny committee, things like the air quality action plan will come up. And I know that we have a rural air quality group that deals with air quality. Um, I just wondered about our relationship, how we react um, with having our own uh, local authority plan with a Liverpool City Region plan. Thanks, Councillor Court. I did, I did actually um, manage to catch the, the essence of your question beforehand. So, yeah, so um, I think the, the key thing about um, the um, action group that we, I mentioned, the senior officer action group that uh, we, we were establishing, uh, being environment and climate emergency, the air quality uh, arrangements for Wirral uh, will report into that group, and, and that group will, will push on and, and, and charge officers on on the, vet, the air quality measurements, etc. So it's not just about uh, um, climate emergency; we'll, we'll cover other environmental aspects on that group. Um, and, and you're right, very much so. We don't operate in a vacuum. We need to work closely with the Metro Mayor and our other um, our city region colleagues. Uh, you know, across the region, and, and we are doing so. Um, um, Councillor Gray attends um, a, a city region uh, group, uh, as I do. That, that those facilities are there. We do need to work with them. That there, there, there are ideas that we need to be uh, macro ideas and, and concepts that we need to be uh, joining in. So that's very much the case. But yeah, air quality is very much part of the um, the group's work, and, uh, and and that we we can we can widen the terms of reference of that group accordingly. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Did anybody else have anything to say? Any other questions? Yes, yeah, if, if I can. Yep, yeah, Councillor Cox. Thank you. Um, it, there was a couple of things that just come to mind. What one um, on our agenda? We haven't got any uh, any any other business as a as agenda item. And I wanted to speak about fly tipping and recycling yeah. centres. I don't know whether that is for now or for later. Um. Councillor Cox, we're not allowed to have any other business on our agendas. Oh, for, for why, Vicky? Enlighten me. I, I should have known that. Because of the access to information rules, members of the public need to know what items are going to be discussed at the meeting. So if we haven't given notice to the public five clear days ahead that we're going to discuss something, it can't be discussed unless okay. the chair decided that it was urgent. Okay. Uh, well, it, I mean, it is um, it is relevant to this agenda item. Um, Tony's going to say it's urgent. Go on, Tony, quick. Yeah, it's, well, um, I, I uh, this week have recently had reason to um, uh, book a, a van for next week uh, in order because I've just so don't don't kill me for trees, people. Uh, I've had to cut back a tree in the back garden, uh, and uh, I'm going to take it to the uh, uh, skip next Monday, hopefully. So. Um, it, 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 looking through the um, uh, the internet to try to find how you went about this at the minute due to COVID, um, it, it's you don't get a pass and just turn up. You have to book an appointment. Um, it, we've we've made it quite difficult to actually go to the skip at the minute, to the recycling centre in in, in Bidston. Um, 
Mike, I don't know whether you've seen, I know I have, around uh, Liverpool and uh, Whittled. Uh, it, and this is only off the top of my head, I've got no figures for it, but there seems to have been, during COVID, uh, a increase in fly tipping. Now, have we got some figures on that? Because I, I, I you know, it, it's, um, say it's, uh, it, it's, it's only off the top of my head, but it, it appears to me that there's been quite a substantial increase. Um, is there a, a correlation between us making it difficult for people to go to skip um, and the recycle centre and increasing uh, 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 fly tipping? And the, the, only, the, other, the other thing was the town hall. I think I mentioned it last time. Mike. Um, one of the things we were talking about, this is back to our, um, our, our plans rather than the, the wider plans for Wirral, uh, just for the council. Um, I, I think I mentioned like the likes of the town hall um uh, the, the the we must fracture energy from the town hall because of the the type of building it is however it's listed um it it the certain things that we would never be able to do anyway even if we wanted to uh the certain people who are uh, are very keen on uh, uh, historic monuments within within the council uh, councillors in particular who would be up in arms if we wanted to do certain things to the uh, to the town hall what what sort of plans are, are, we, are we putting in place there? Because it, we'll, 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 we're never putting electric heating in there. It would just be so expensive. Uh, it would be prohibitive. Um, so we the, the type of heating that we have now, which I think we said last time was some sort of back boiler in the basement um, and is probably unbelievably inefficient. But we're never going to get around that. So what's, what's the plan on those sorts of buildings? Okay, first, the first uh, question about fly tipping and um, the um, the household recycling centres or the public tip, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, is that first, yeah, first and fundamentally, we don't we don't actually manage those. They're, they're the waste disposal authorities facilities. If you call, way uh, back in the in the early lockdown, it was fairly early on. The disposal authority, in league with um, disposal authorities up and down the country, decided to close those facilities. So we had a point where those facilities closed. Uh, people were at home, and yes, there was a definite um, uh, uh, prerequisite increase in fly tipping, poorly contained domestic waste in alleyways and that sort of stuff, but also criminal elements really taking advantage of low key roads. And there's some significant and pretty horrendous fly tipping in vulnerable locations across the borough, across the region, across the country. That was sort of going on. The Disposal Authority reopened their facilities, but with severely restricted numbers on site. So you could, I think it was like originally it was four people initially, four cars. Um, and we knew that you know, there was major queuing uh, issues on site. They've relaxed those numbers, uh, but they're still not um, they're still not allowing the number of cars that would be in normal circumstances because of social distancing. So yeah. queues have tended to drop down on these facilities, but they're they're still um, um, they're, yeah they're, they're still can be inconsistent. You can turn up there's a big queue, and you can turn up there's not. But it's their facilities, and they, they, that's how they monitor it. And it's it's the social distancing issue that they that they are maintaining. So it's like that we we keep working with them on that, but it, it is their facilities. But you're right, there has been a prerequisite uh, or a relationship with with flights being increasing because of that. Um, booking um, um, uh, 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 disposal of, of certain things is again linked to their arrangements for social uh, distancing, etc. On site, uh, we can keep keep working them. There's a member of the disposal authority on the, on the committee. Uh, but you know uh, their their contract of earlier and their organisation is clear that they're working towards national guidelines about how many cars can be on site at any one time. Um, so the, the second the second issue um, uh, is obviously all about the the future asset of the council moving forward. Uh, forget leisure centres and, and, the, and those sort of issues. Uh, what we do with back office buildings and, and ceremonial or civic buildings is very much part of the considerations of the recovery plan. And it, it, it seems obvious that we won't need the number of uh, back office facilities moving forward with, with a blended approach we've just discussed uh, in response to Councillor Cook's um, question. Um, issues about um, building efficiency um, and performance of, of buildings like Wallace Town Hall are going to have to be looked at that obje objectively and realistically as about what we can do and, and, and its impact on on the council's finances and everything else. So I, 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 I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that, that is an active consideration now about what is the size of our assets moving forward? What do we need in this in this new world, this new green reset um, uh, moving forward? Uh, and I'm sure I know Wallace Town Hall is in that consideration. 
Thanks, uh, Mike. Cheers. Uh, just as a comment to that, um, and I'll get I'll I'll get out the way and let someone else have a, a say. It, 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 it's it's just about and this ties into active transport, which I mentioned Monday. It's about having a pragmatic approach. The reality is we're not going to level Wallasey Town Hall and put something more energy efficient there. It's got far too much mean and and it's far too much of a beautiful building. And it it, it is uh, it, whilst it will be. Uh, ideal to have a nice new um, uh, building with with uh, water reclaim and uh, treble glazing and all the rest of it. The reality is the building is going to be there and we are going to own it and be custodians of it for a long time to come. So it is about that pragmatic approach. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Councillor Cox. Um, we we are going to run out of time if we if we carry on with any more questions. But and I believe um, David Armstrong wishes to speak. Is that correct? It's only very quickly, Chair, just to add to what's been said. I think the Council will have to plan to end up with, with a small number of very special buildings that will, that will be unique and where they won't be fully adaptable. Places like the Town Hall, Birkenhead Town Hall, indeed the Solar Campus, Liso Road, the Priory. There will be a, a number of buildings where it, 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 we can't do a great deal to them. The Town Hall is a nice example. Um, it has decent gas boilers. The control mechanisms are... are, are of any different era and it has all its original pipe work which radiates through the building and all the original radiators and things so it is very difficult to do things with those buildings but we, we, we will hopefully be occupying fewer buildings overall where well, we definitely will be and therefore we'll be left with a smaller state of specialist buildings where we'll have to be as councillor cox says we'll have to be pragmatic thank you thanks david thank you um and i know that we've had a, an amendment proposed and seconded so i think we need to move to um either agree that amendment and um and, or we need to vote on it um do we need to be reminded what the amendment was it was um councillor fox or vicky can you remind us what the amendment was please i think chair that uh, councillor fox has suggested that at uh, point three in the recommendation that's written down uh, it's amended to a membership of seven so as to reflect the political makeup of the host committee three two one one Okay. Exactly. It. That's okay. been seconded by yeah. um, Councillor Muspratt. And and to reassure Tony, uh, my, my experience of of working groups uh, are that they try to reach consensus, and I do agree with Tony. The agenda that that we're putting forward will need consensus and buy-in from everybody. So it, it it can only help buy-in if we have all put all people included in the decision. Thank so, you. Chair, if the members are happy to deal with that by assent, we can deal with that decision by assent. Otherwise, we'll have to have a vote and I'll do a roll call. So, is that okay with assent? Does anybody uh, want to vote? I think we can take that as assent, Councillor Gray. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you, everybody. So, we're moving on to item number six, which is the parking policy prioritising safety around schools, which can be found on pages 25 to 72. Um, this report is in response to the notice of motion passed unanimously at Council in October 2019, and it proposes relatively minor revisions to the Council's current parking enforcement policy that was adopted in March 2012. There are three sections being revised, and the revisions are an exact reproduction of the requested amendments made in the notice of motion. If approved, the revised policy will be published on our website, which is a legal requirement. And we've got um, Simon Fox, I believe, is here, um, who is the Assistant Director, Highways and Infrastructure. Did anybody have any questions? Does anybody have any questions or comments about this item? Well, Chair, if, if you could bring me in. I, I, I agree that the notice of motion was passed unanimously and um, certainly uh, this is a policy that reflects that and certainly if anything is precious in our lives it's our school children and, and those are in and around school so it, it is you know re-emphasizing work in and around that area um, but members have, have reminded me and certainly I'm a governor at a school and, a, and I know Tony Norbury has mentioned this um, there's some pretty hefty traffic control now due to COVID outside schools, roads being blocked off and, and still still people parking in strange ways around, in and around schools. And I think that is right for the emphasis. But 
I would see this as us publicising to the people where we are and what the public will expect if they park, you know, irresponsibly or endanger someone's life. So it's up there. My 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 question is that as you know the public's agenda moves on, um, we can revisit this in the future and it, it, you know with other emphasis. So, for example, and I'm not quoting this uh, as um, what we want to do, but over in Liverpool they had a big campaign about pavement parking, and that seems to be what the public were telling them to do. I'm just wondering how how often we revisit to adapt to reflect what the public are telling us as becoming more of a nuisance and more of a danger. So uh, it's it's a great start and it's a very well written report and no one could be possibly uh, in any doubt of what the policy means and what, what, and what, what people can expect and that that's right to be upfront. So my view is that it it, it is to be adopted tonight. I, I would suggest it gets adopted tonight. but. Periodically, we need to review what the people's priorities are and what and where the casualties are arising. So we adapt to to trends. So if there's trends in a particular area, then we can adapt the policy to focus on that area. If there's a sort of a habit that's developing with 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 people, uh, it, you know, doing certain things through changes in behaviour, then we can adapt the policy. So it shouldn't be set set in stone, but it has to be publicised, as you say, as a legal requirement. And that's where we start. And I think this committee is well placed now to come back and review this on a regular basis. So thank you for allowing me to contribute, Chair. Thanks, Steve. Um, does, does Simon want to say anything um, in response to that? Thanks, Chair. Yes, I, I will, if that's OK. Just to say that um, uh, members may be aware that on this um, on this committee's uh, work plan there is um, a proposal to bring forward a road safety new road safety action plan and strategy, uh, which obviously will take account of uh, the issues that Councillor Fawkes has, has mentioned. Just on the um, the enforcement around schools, just to emphasise to members that we are we we have implemented this and in in terms of. Um, since schools returned, we've we've issued 92 penalty charge notices as opposed to 55 in the same period last year. So we are working on trying to to implement um, you know the the enforcement anyway in in school areas. And in terms of pavement parking, um, Councillor Fouts is right that it's a it's a high profile issue. The Liverpool City Region Combined Authority have actually consulted with uh, with their. Um, with, with the, the, the councils about what um, what what government policy they want to uh, they want to, to pursue on this because government have been considering for some time introducing legislation around pavement parking to make it easier to enforce. There's three options on the table, which is to uh, roll out a London-style prohibition notice on pavement parking, which they have in, in specifically in the London boroughs, um, to do. Um, traffic regulation orders specific to pavement parking or to use civil enforcement um, which we have with with parking enforcement generally to enforce pavement parking and that's the preferred option that we've highlighted to city region and in, in the consultation that they've presented to us so hopefully there will be um, new legislation on pavement parking and that will enable us to take take appropriate action on that as well of course we have to be mindful that there are areas where you know, pavement parking is is necessary because of the uh, the geometry of the roads, and and you know we we will be just targeting it where it's uh, where it's a clear danger to road users. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Simon. Councillor Norbury. Yeah, I, I thank you for the report, and and you know read, read and understood it. I think a, a big solution to to the parking around the school. I'm a school governor at Prenton Primary School at the moment. And, and I'm uh, constantly aware with the head teachers and, and, and other teachers getting in touch with me as a community governor, asking me to sort out the, the parking problems around Prenton Primary School and Devonshire Park School, which is very, very challenging. Um, well, due to COVID, uh, the school have adopted a, a um, staggered approach uh, where different year group, groups come in at different times. And this has really alle alleviated the problem. It's still a problem that exists. But it's really alleviated the problem. So I think innovative um, suggestions, innovative um, practices like this uh, can help, and it's something we should um, should be looking at um, in in the mix of all this. But there's one thing um, that is absolutely clear that we need an integrated transport system that is accessible to all, publicly owned if possible. 
um, that would be a, a big answer to um, uh, to what we've been talking about before. Um, we, we quote in London, London has got a different transport system to us, it's publicly owned. The transport system in London, unfortunately, our transport systems were all privatised and, um, you know, the days where kids used to get buses to school and with the parents and so forth isn't possible anymore because buses uh, run at the times where shareholders make the most profits, not where people um, can use them. That might be an answer to um, Mr Cox, Tony Cox getting to work, <laughs> what he was talking about before, you know, we can use um, taxi systems and integrated transport systems which give people real choice in what types of or modes of transport they want to use. So if people want to use more environmentally friendly types of transport, be it their electric, their electric cars or car sharing schemes or buses or trains, um, they've got that choice instead of using fossil burning modes of transport. And that's what we need to get away from. It's not the difference between using a car or, or you know, or not using a car. It's a, it's a difference between using a mode of transport that does cause damage to our environment. And if we have an integrated transport system that's designed for the most challenged person, we've produced a transport system for, for everybody, and that will give people real choice. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Tony. Um, Anna, can you see who's got their hands up? Because I... Yes, I can. I've got um, Helen Cameron, Tony Cox, and then Chris Cook. Helen, do you want to speak? Yeah, hi. Um, so a subject that came up at the previous Environment Scrutiny Committee a couple of times um, was around car engines idling. And I understand um, that we're talking about the air quality and the air quality was driven by Liverpool, really. The air quality uh, task force over there was set up about two years ago. I think um, Andy wasn't on it then. Um, but cars idling near to schools is something that I think I mentioned three times during uh, environment scrutiny. Um, and obviously, Liz, you're a cabinet member, so it's really a point, if Simon could help me understand, is this falling between two stools? Have we issued any fines whatsoever for car engines idling anywhere? Or have we issued any fines for car engines idling near schools? And does it come into this enforcement element or is it being missed out in the equation somewhere? Thanks. Simon? Um, I'm not aware that this covers the idling engines, but I do take your point and I will look into that and find out whether we've issued any penalties for, for car idling and whether, whether we've got that power. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Simon. OK, thanks. Thank you. Um, I, was it um, Chris Cook? Did you have a question? Yes, uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, may well be that Tony, uh, Councillor Cox, has got in before me, but uh, I'm quite happy to go with mine. It's it's as much as anything else, um, you know, uh, a statement of my uh, agreement with the councillors who've expressed their own particular insights and perspectives on this issue. Um, I agree with uh, uh, all the councillors and the various points we've made. I think they're all very valid. Uh, the only point I would make, would, would stress, is that there is, if you look at the holistic picture, you know, there is um, a connection with environmental benefits here too, because obviously um, if parents feel their children are safer um, around the school premises, you know, and we can build on to that by introducing, which we've committed to do, um, 20 mile an hour speed limits maximum uh, in all residential areas, then we could look forward to a situation which prevailed probably when I was at school in the 1960s, where the majority of children actually walked to school, you know, because so far I've been talking about all the different modes of transport that children can get to school in. Uh, we're most concerned about primary uh, school children, and the vast majority of those do still live within a mile of their local school, you know, for example, in the two schools that are in my ward. Um, and I know that the majority of children would prefer to walk because um, a year ago I was invited into Devonshire Park Primary to talk to Year 6, Year 5 and 6 about this. Uh, since then I've become a governor on that school only recently and um, I'm absolutely sure the majority of children would prefer that form of active travel, you know, walking. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Councillor Cook. Uh, did anybody else have their hand up? It's Councillor Cox and Councillor Norbury, Chair. Councillor Cox, a new point? 
Uh, I've not come in on this one. Uh, okay. No. We, okay, go on, Councillor Cox. Uh, I've been uh, uh, uncharacteristically quiet up to now. Um, uh, always happy to give way to uh, Chris uh, Cook, of course, and well done for remembering uh, when you went to school, Chris. Uh, impressive. Um, just it's a bit anecdotal this one, but uh, whilst I'm not uh, massively a fan of slapping fines on everyone for anything to, uh, in order to bring them into line, um, it, it, literally every school I've been on has had, uh, as a governor, has had issues with parking and with um, uh, you know dangerous situations near misses. Um, uh, for the teachers out there, and I know there's at least two on this call. Um, I know you you sent out to stand outside, talk to the uh, to the the, the, the parents. Um, I, I, we even did an action day. Myself and my uh, one of my colleagues were standing in high vis. We had the police there. We had the teachers there. They were still pulling up on double uh, on zigzag lines, on double yellow lines. Um, ultimately, um, I, I don't actually believe there's any other uh, uh, course of action available other than enforcement. I think literally. Uh, uh, Every, every bit of carrot has been worn out on this particular topic and unfortunately a little bit of stick is going to have to be applied for people to actually get the gist and yeah I, I, you know i agree with chris uh, cook as well on the, on the walk into school I, I walked to school mine was a couple of miles every day um which seems to have actually completely and totally died out and when you speak to some of the parents the distances that they've actually traveled is nominal nominal with the with the child in the car and that is something that um Again, I think I'm probably down as some sort of automotive freak because of the, some of the comments that come out with, with regards to the car. But that sort of journey is just not, it's not reasonable. Um, uh, and I think anything that we can do to promote people actually walking with the child, which is good for them anyway. We've got a child obesity problem in this country. You can see the connection coming in, um, that it, it's, it's, it's a good thing. So it, it's something I can happily support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cox. And was there anybody else who had anything to say? Okay. No, all hands are clear now, no. Chair. Thank you. Can we agree the recommendation then, which is to approve the revised parking enforcement policy, um, which was in the Appendix A to this report? Can we all agree that? Agreed. 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 Brilliant. Thank you very much. So that takes us to um, item number seven, which is the 2021-22 budget process, which is on pages 73 to 84. Um, and I'm going to ask um, Nikki Busworth, who's the Director of Neighbourhoods, to introduce this report as well. Thanks, Nikki. OK, thank you. Um, so I am mindful that there was... Um, all member briefing on the budget process and the budget process has been through um, PNR on the 7th of October. Um, but just to reiterate and provide a high level overview, this report provides the committee with the process for the budget setting as a transition year with the first year of the committee for 21-22 and also describes the financial position, which at quarter one was a deficit of 45 million. It also details the actions being put in place to mitigate the gap. These actions include a phased approach of five stages. This includes a timeline for the 21-22 budget setting process of when budget proposals are presented to the policy and services committees for the recommendations to full council to set the balanced budget. As this is the transition year, proposals are being identified and will be presented to the committees by officers due to the tight time scales to approve the budget. However, the committee is very much encouraged to identify their own proposals to work with off that you want us as officers to work up um, within the time scales to be included in the 2021-22 budget. For future years, um, it will be the usual process and throughout the year for the committee that we will work together. Um, committee will identify proposals for officers to work up for the following year's budget. So in terms of the recommendation, it is simply that this report, uh, the committee note the council's current financial position and process for the 21-22 budget as, as this transition year. Um, in terms of highlighting a few areas in the report for your um, consideration. 
3.4 of the report describes how the deficit is made up. It also, in 3.6, details the mitigations um, that the council are taking, and also uh, the council's request for permission from MHCLG to apply to the Treasury for a capitalisation directive. This will help towards mitigating the budget gap. The following sections of the report cover the resetting of the medium term financial plan, where a forecast budget for the following year, so that's 21-22, of 45 million, and it also identifies the unachievable savings and additional costs and pressures. In 3.12 of the report, it discusses and talks through the budget deficit mitigations. Senior officers have been working to identify options to mitigate the overall deficit and working through a programme of immediate actions that can be taken now and in the longer term to ensure the budget is sustainable for the future. The process to set the balanced budget is described in five phases, which are detailed in the report. Section four of the report shows the timescales for the budget process, and it also describes the workshops that the committee and us as officers will that will take place over the coming weeks and months so that we can work through the budget options and initiatives to bridge the budget gap. This is the first committee around budgets and the, bud the committee are asked to note there are two charts and a graph on page 81 of the report. It's come to light for reasons not yet clear. Whilst the first table is correct on that page, the second table and the associated graph is incorrect. The narrative within 5.2 of the report is correct. So I apologise to the committee for this error. We'll issue a note to the committee and ensure the correct figures are recorded in the minutes. I just want to pass you now to Sarah Cox, who's our business partner for finance, just to talk you through this committee's budget position. So if I can just hand you over to Sarah now. Thank you. Um, so I'll just go through the uh, budget position for this area, um, which just picks up the the this committee's element of the neighbourhoods budget. And this is the position as at quarter one. So things have moved on slightly in some of the areas since this um, report was produced, but a lot of the areas have remained steady um, between quarter one and quarter two. So I'll just go through each area each paragraph individually, starting with um, paragraph 5.2. This explains the um, projected um, adverse variance against um, community patrol, and that contributes to £295,000 towards the adverse variance projected at quarter one. And this is like mainly related to following the loss of several contracts in previous years. Um, the service has actually attempted to mitigate this because they're using like additional income generation opportunities for new clients, but there is unfortunately is an insufficient market for this at the moment. Um, there is actually a planned review of this service and there's future, future staffing requirements for later in the year to help mitigate this loss. Um, moving on to the next area, um, there's a loss actually reported at quarter one was related to car parking income and this was um, following temporary suspension of the services from April. When this report was produced, this was based on the quarter one assumptions and projections. So at the time, the figures assumed that the car parking would be like recommenced in August 2020. And the projection at the time was 1.592 million. Um, and that contributes towards the adverse variance overall. There are actually some small mitigations within this area because there's um, favourable variances relating to employees and there's also other smaller income targets that have been achieved in part, which helps bring the overall position down slightly to just over 1.4 million. Um, then within that, there's also the other main area is um, within the environment and park section. There's been actually a loss of income of just over a million pounds within this area this year projected. And this is mainly due to two areas, um, partly the garden waste service, because the service was temporarily suspended uh, at the first part of the year. And as a result of this, uh, this has actually resulted in 540k um, adverse variance on the service um, because the subscribers, they were actually obviously like um, recommencing the service later in the year. But it's been a re because it was reintroduced at a, a lower rate. Um, that's actually um, resulted in an adverse variance this year. The other part of the 
adverse variants that makes up part of the million is related to the football and bowling clubs within parks because they generate a lot of income within the parks area but unfortunately because those services were suspended at the first part of the year they've been unable to achieve any of the income targets they'd normally be able to achieve um most of this income is actually front loaded towards the beginning of spring when the services were obviously like put under suspension so um even if the services come back up and running later in the year, there's not much scope to make up a lot of that income loss. Um, work is underway to actually mitigate some of the losses through attracting additional garden waste subscribers for 2020-21 on top of what we've already managed to retain. And this is going to be achieved through marketing campaigns. And there are also plans to implement um, the direct debit scheme, which has been implemented now. Um, Parks is also planning to reopen some of their facilities um, to sports clubs in line with government guidance, which is underway, but that will lead to, lead to recovery of some of the lost income. But unfortunately, a lot of the lost income this year, we will not be able to, to claw back from this service. Um, there are plans to actually claim back some of the income, as mentioned before, through the um, government's income loss compensation scheme. So, But um, they haven't actually been reported in this, in this report at the moment. Um, overall, this service is not clear from the tables, but overall, this element of neighbourhoods is projecting a 2.77 million adverse variance as a, based on the quarter one figures. It's changed slightly um, in later later quarters, but at the moment it was 2.77 and most of these most of these figures remain like up to date. And when as and mainly it's because of the result of COVID has caused these adverse variances. Um, so that's. That concludes the revenue budget part of the monitoring, and then just move on to the capital budget. Um, the capital, um, the capital scheme at the moment is reporting um, 20, 22.3 million um, on the cabinet program, and then 34.5 million against um, June program, and the actual spend is at quarter one was only minimal at 1.762. And then this next section just breaks down the funding as well between borrowing grants, which is what the main part of the funding is. And then there's the smaller um, smaller elements of funding from other areas. So I think the capital is still being monitored and underway to, to see what spend can be actually achieved this year. Um, so that concludes the financial report based on the quarter one figures. So if anybody has any questions, then we can just move on to that. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Does anybody have any questions? Is that Councillor Cook? Councillor Cook, do you have yes, a question? Yes, I just have what, one question what, about one aspect of that, actually. It's the, um, it's the end of August when um, the um, payments for the shortened um, municipal year for the um, brown bin collection was reintroduced and there was the option to pay as before uh, one-off payment um, or the direct debit I think was introduced. Now I tried the one-off payment, thought it was all set up with that and so I thought the payment went through and apparently it hadn't so I didn't get the first collection and I had quite a few residents um, contacting me saying that it wasn't they weren't successful in, in you know uh, resuming the service and, and making payments so I'm just wondering if the council has been able to assess how much money lost through that, through people failing to be able to pay um, the lesser amount, uh, and whether it, you know, if that is the case, if quite a lot of money has been lost through that, um, should perhaps a bit more money be invested in, you know, upgrading the that part of the council website, really. That's all it is. Okay, thank you. Um, within that area, I don't know whether Mike's got any more additional comments to make on this, but I think at the moment we don't actually like produce a report to show how much has been how much has been lost as a result of that. But we, it's something we could actually look into, like to find more information out about it, and then come back to you. Yeah. Unless um, Mike's got any more detailed responses from his system. I'll give a quick update there. Um, yes, the uh, as we all know, garden waste was suspended for several months. The uh, new subscription year was delayed. So the fact it was a three-quarter year uh, um, uh, period, so it's a, a reduced fee. There was a huge demand because we wanted to renew that. There were some issues about capacity in terms of issuing out bins um, and renewing, but they were resolved. We're now back to 40,000 uh, subscribers. 
which is a, which is the nucleus of what we, need, we tend to have a, a per year. So I'm not aware of people who've tried and, and failed and, and given up. I, I think people that may have had some problems initially, but they got back in there. Um, this year, I think it was one of the recommendations or observations of your predecessor, the um, the, the uh, screening committee, to um, introduce direct debit scheme. And um, the good news is that over 6,000 people use the direct direct debit system to uh, enrol uh, their subscription. There is a slight down. We, we made it clear in the print is that because of a cooling off period, there is a delay in your first collection because of that on, on direct debit. There's no way around that when you when you initially um, um, sign up, but once people are in, obviously their their their, their direct debit carries on. But in answer to Councillor Cook's question, I'm not aware of significant numbers giving up. We've got the 40,000 subscribers that have tended to uh, subscribe each year. We obviously want to to, to attract more to uh, eat into the deficit that Sarah mentioned. But yeah, our our, our core uh, group are, are resubscribed. Yes, thanks for that, Mike. Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly encouraging people to sign up for the direct debit. I mean, I know how that works. You know, people, um, if they make a one-off payment, they forget to renew. If it's direct debit, um, you could call it inertia sales, but in a positive sense, in a good way. Yeah, thanks so much for that. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Nikki, did you want to come back in on this? I don't know. I think it's been covered. Been covered. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> Christina, did you have something to say? Yes, just just on the point that um, Councillor Cook made, um, I got uh, some residents who had problems initially in getting, um, thinking they'd paid and they hadn't, um, which was very easily resolved uh, when they contacted me. And also um, the department sent out uh, notification to people to say um, that they were then late in sending out the stickers uh, but put your bin out because it will be uh, it will be emptied so people who hadn't remembered to subscribe or were having problems put their bins out and they were emptied uh, in in my area um, and uh, but I think Councillor Cook's right I do think there is something not quite right with with the system and I think it just needs the electronic system needs tweaking a bit uh, to get it right. Thanks, Christina. I I agree. Um, I think um, I think it's a really good idea to have the direct debit, but I just think um, we, we need to just be careful that nobody's slipping through the net because I've had a, um, a resident just contact me in the last few days about that. Um, Councillor Clox, have you got a point? Uh, thanks, Chair. I don't know whether this is one for Sarah or it might be Nikki directly. I'm just going to read from the report. Uh, just bear with me. Yeah, fi uh, point 5.1, which I think Nikki touched on before, um, it says the tables below for 2021 budgets for each council directorate and for each of the committees. Uh, the budgets for the Environment, Climate, Emergency and Transport Committee is included uh, with the neighbourhoods directorates. This is something that um, uh, uh, the chair and myself sp uh, uh, have spoken about it with regards to the actual budgets. I think it came up um, uh, at our informal briefing as well. Only 34, only 34.272, uh, uh, that'll be million, uh, of total neighbourhoods budgets of the 60 million is controllable. The remainder of the budget consists of 17.182 levies and 9.232 of central support costs. So, are we are we effectively saying that we've got 34 point million uh, 34.2 million to play with uh, within the directives and uh, uh, how we're going to spend it and hopefully spend it wisely but also the 17.18 and the nine can someone just give me a, a breakdown of what they are and if it's too big to do now can we have uh, can we have a, a, a something a note sent out to all members on the uh, committee please just to see if there's anything that we can um is there anything in there with support costs that we don't need um uh, really and do we have a choice and the uh, same with the levies uh, what exactly are they and who are levying them against us thank you yeah um so thank you councillor cox so um you're absolutely in terms of those central support costs and those other costs that's what i would anticipate we would be working through um you know in those uh, collectively in the in the workshop so absolutely so the levies include um our transport levy and 
you know, Mike referred to the Merseyside Waste Authority, we're one of a number of Liverpool City region in that. So they are levies that are, you know, more like a tax really um it's not a contract as such um so we we are limited i suppose that was the point there we, although that 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 it was to make that point that that budget um there is some un, spend that is not controllable and they they're those levies captured there um and the 34 million is across the whole of the neighborhoods area so this committee covers part of that but not all and um, so there's other other committees um which our budget of 34 million will fall under if you like in terms of a committee budget uh, so leisure libraries uh, for example will be under um the tourism culture um and communities committee so uh, uh, sarah can advise on on that at uh, that split um but that's how it, it's laid out. But we'll go through all of this, um, you know, when we have our workshops as well in more detail. But absolutely, we'll get you that information following up to this committee. Thanks, Sarah. Just before you come in, um, on, the, on the transport levies in the Liverpool City Region levy, um, whilst you're saying they've effectively attacked so uh, that they just get taken away from us because we are part of that particular uh, uh, authority and body, um, are we... What, it's, I'm guessing it's still open to us, though, for the for the likes of the leader of the council, with in 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 conjunction with the chief exec and whoever the other representatives are on the uh, LCR. And then when you say transport levy, we're, we're, I'm guessing we're talking what used to be Mersey Mersey Travel, which is now part of LCR as well. Um, they they could still be de debated and uh, questioned, though, couldn't they, by our representative Snicky, and we could actually um, still try to. I won't say drive down, that's the wrong uh, uh, phrase. We could still um, negotiate uh, to see if uh, our um, our donations are actually flexible. Is that is that true to say? It would have to be a collective. Uh, I think Councillor Norby wants to come in here, um, but it would have to be a collective um, an agreement across the all parties or across the Liverpool city region, but it is, it is statutory, um, you know, in terms of has to be paid, the levies are statutory and has to be paid. Okay, thanks. Councillor Norbury. Yeah, just, just to be helpful, um, Chair, uh, as a representative on the uh, Waste Authority, uh, Steve Williams is the Tory representative on the Waste Authority, um, which Councillor Cox may find useful to, to get in touch with Steve regarding these issues. Uh, the levy is is paid um, to the Waste Authority. We 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 pay through our council tax for the collection of the of our, our curbside waste, and the Waste Authority are paid to dispose of it. We produce about a ton of waste per household. And our levy is charged um, to Wirral Borough Council uh, in respect of the tonnage of waste that goes to the waste authority for them to dispose of. Um, that we are in control of that levy. Um, the levy is set by the waste authority in conjunction with the six councils. But if we were to reduce a lot less waste, and we have got a, 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 a zero waste strategy uh, as part of our climate emergency at the waste authority as well as Wirral Council. So if we get to that them levels, um, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that we reduce um, the levy cost costs to to almost zero if we're not giving them any of our any of our waste. So that's why it's so important um, to up our recycling um, f facilities, recycling f figures, and and obviously as Councillor Cox was saying before regarding the uh, recycling and waste centres. Uh, which were unfortunately closed because the government didn't allow people to leave their houses to travel to the um, to the recycling centres uh, during the COVID lockdown, and that caused a, a backlog of of people uh, wanting to get rid of their waste, and unfortunately that that led to uh, fly tipping. Uh, once the recycling centres were reopened. Uh, then we had a stampede of people wanting to use them because, um, you know, the, the waste had, had accumulated. So um, we are a little bit in control of that. It's not exactly a tax. It, 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 it's, it's a charge 
um, for a service, basically. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Norbury. Um, Councillor Fox, no. do you have a question? Well, again, Chair, I, I had no intention of, of speaking. Um, we're in a, a very bleak budgetary situation, but the two big asks I've heard from the officers and all the councils is one, uh, a degree of capitalisation. So if you've underspent capital, can you use that capital to bolster the budget? Um, in times of emergency, it seems a very sensible thing. So we hope we get a yes on that. The next one is there is a compensation scheme because all these losses are directly linked to COVID uh, and, you know, other businesses, other institutions are being helped out with uh, extra funding to cope with what COVID has thrown at it. So we, there, there's the next big ask for from government. So we really need to push on those because anything we don't get from that will come back to hit us in terms of services and what we deliver. And again, I, I, you know, this is a public meeting, people listen to it. And uh, Tony Cox talked about donations to Mersey, what was Mersey Travel, the Transport Committee, he talks about donations to uh, the Waste Authority. These are services that people provide. Mersey Travel provides ferries, trains, buses. It spends, an awful, it spends nearly 20 million pound on supported bus networks to get to, the, to, to subsidize those routes that aren't um, making any money for the private uh, contractors which tony norbury referred to earlier uh, and to sort of say oh, it's, a, it's a donation just to reassure councillor cox as, a, as the lead member for finance on the transport committee in the last four years we have delivered uh, a 10 percent decrease in the levy two five percent a freeze and only last year was the first time we put it up by two and a half percent so we are mindful that the levy has an implication on the finances of all the authorities that make up the uh the merseyside region and we do our level best to cut our costs so we don't put any more burden on on the host authorities we also part of that levy subsidize the best concessionary travel scheme outside of london for our people over the age of 60. so it's not a donation you get every penny back that you put in in terms of services for the people and i hope that's settled any confusion for those public who think we're making a charitable donation to mersey travel chair chair if i if i may just come back to uh, if you will uh, indulge me come back on that if, uh, if I may. can you be brief please i'll be very i'll be very brief no it, it's the, the point is this steve four years has harped on to me about uh, wanting ideas from uh, the opposition and i said well once we get to the committee system you'll get them steve <clears throat> and the focus there from councillor Fox was on um, the handout to get as much money from the government as possible. And I agree with that totally that uh, COVID has been so disruptive that yes, the, the, the bigger the, um, uh, the, the bigger the settlements we get, fantastic. But also, as you will know uh, from, from his, uh, his work experience as well, there's two sides to your budget. There's the outgoings and the ingoing, uh, incomings. So whilst we want to get a good settlement from the government, we also need to be scrutinising exactly where our uh, uh, monies are going. And if, if it's going on levies, we need to see is that something that can be driven down. It's it's that simple. It's not it's not a political point. It wasn't uh, it's trying to uh, influence the uh, anyone who's sad enough to be watching it uh, uh the the transmission it's uh it's just pure uh, uh simple economics so i hope you know i hope he does see that it was in good faith what i was actually saying thanks councillor well, again again to just reiterate the figures we have been mindful of the impact under 10 years of tory austerity what what has done to the services we can provide we are mindful uh the transport committee whilst when setting our budget and our levy that we don't make the situation any worse than the tory government has made it for the so we are making political points the, 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 um, oh, you, right. you, okay. you 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 try to to tempt me I into this so you're getting I the barely, answer barely that didn't. you deserve getting the answer you deserve so we are mindful so as i say we don't set the levy and say, oh, we'll just put it up by 5% because we want to. We, we set the levy to provide those very services that our people demand, such as supported bus services, such as concessionary fare for pensioners, uh, such as reducing tunnel tolls and, and all the things that have gone with it. So so it's, it, 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 it's, it is a, and, and the leaders, the leaders, 
get together city region and they are mindful of trying to cut costs and so are we so we all work together i would hope and uh, you have a representative on the transport committee uh councillor paul hayes so but again to reiterate tony's words perhaps you can have a word with him at how hard we've worked to keep the costs down thank you both of you thanks um points well made um are there any other points to be made on this um, councillor cook. cook has his hand up thanks anna Yeah, thanks. Uh, I just want to make a general point really about the you know, budgetary deficit that we're going to have to face and deal with one way or another. Well, through several means, uh, I would suggest. I mean, obviously, you know, the council, it employs people, uh, experts uh, in the financial department to manage to keep our own house in order as far as possible. Um, I note that the uh, I read the uh, the monthly local government association magazine, which represents councils across the country and councillors of all different political groups and there's a general movement i can see there um a consensus that you know central government needs to um come up with a much more satisfactory way of financial and local government because local government has been underfinanced and um you know uh, in a very sort of sporadic and unpredictable way which has made it very hard for local authorities to uh, to, to plan in the long term which is really what everybody needs and all i'm thinking of is you know exceptional circumstances require exceptional measures and sub authorities have um, piloted um, what are variously termed as community investment bonds um, municipal investment bonds which is basically uh, appealing to residents with some spare cash you know perhaps languishing in uh, bank accounts not being invested by banks who are trying to build up the financial you know, cash resources and everything else uh, for the next financial crisis uh, or investing in things that they wouldn't the ordinary citizens wouldn't like to see money invested in like producing arms to sell to countries whose regimes we don't like and so on so there are plenty of residents who are quite wealthy and also quite uh, well-intentioned and generous you know and if we could approach them in the right way um I'm sure that we could, and if there were no legal impediments in terms of, you know, raising money in a voluntary way from our own residents to to help plug some of these funding uh, budgetary gaps, I'm sure it could be done. Where there's a will, there's a way. You know, uh, we did this in the war. You know, uh, government bonds, uh, which have turned in peacetime into 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 premium bonds. People don't, you know. Uh, think twice about uh, putting a few hundred pounds in those well why not do it on a local basis and help to f uh, finance in a sustainable way you know uh, perhaps a thousand pounds here a thousand pounds there in, 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 a, in a two to three year bond lending money you know as an investment not for personal gain but uh, uh, investing in the local community you know I, th I think that idea that concept has a lot of mileage and it's something we may um, in a purely positive sense, not in purely expedient sense, but in a, in a generally positive sense, uh, look into in the future. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Cook, and that does link with what was being said before, that we do need to, um, in noting the Council's current financial position, we do need to be uh, mindful of the, the gravity of the situation, and, and potentially we need to be quite creative going forwards as well. Yeah. Um, and, and I reassure you, Councillor Cook, that conversations about uh, such bonds are being had within the council um, because I've I've also um, been part of that as well. Whether anything comes of that, I don't know, but um, I, I share your 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 ideas on that. Um, if an, and nobody else has got any questions or suggestions about this, I'm mindful that this is a to note the, the financial situation and the process for this this transition year, and that it is un, an unusual situation because of the transition from cabinet to committee system, and because of COVID. Um, are we in agreement with what we've heard so far? Are we are we uh, in agreement that we can consider the council's current financial yeah. position and process for the 21-22 budget in this transition year? Are we okay to agree that? Chair, can I just confirm that that's been seconded? Seconded. Thank you, Councillor Musgrave. Yeah. I think that's agreed by a censure. Thank you. Thanks, Vicky. So that moves us on to, um, you'll have to forgive me because I've got di different um, numbering in my, in my notes here. Um, that brings on to item number eight, I believe. Is That's that correct? Yeah. 
So with item number eight, uh, budget and performance monitoring, pages 85 to 90. And I'm going to invite uh, the Director of Neighbourhoods, Nikki Butterworth, again to introduce this report. Thanks, Nikki. Hi, thank you all. Um, so this is a report um, around the performance management um, and support um, working with the committee going forward in terms of performance monitoring and those reports. Um, and it proposes uh, an approach for shaping the future of that reporting. Obviously, through the scrutiny committees, etc. for many years, you've been used to receiving um, uh, reporting information. But as a new committee and a new system, we want to ensure as officers that we work with you and that this, the data and the information and the dashboards you receive are robust and clear um, in terms of performance monitoring that's in place. Um, the new performance reports will be developed and regularly presented to committee and will include a range of indicators to give the committee meaningful overview of key areas that are of interest to the committee. Um, we work with the committee to develop those. Um, it's in, we anticipate that the, the framework of the um, reports would or could model um, something similar to the COVID dashboard, which was set up at the start of the coronavirus pandemic back in, in March. Um, that's been very, we've had very good feedback um, from members and our local MPs on those dashboards and how useful and informative they've been. Um, we want it to be clear and, and, and accessible in terms of data. We want it to be timely and meaningful. And this proposal is, is that the committee helped to shape and agree what measures that you would like to see included. Uh, it's a very wide range of, of data sets, and this is a very wide ranging committee. Um, so we we see us working together um, with, with you and the committee around developing those dashboards to include indicators to show progress on the Wirral plan for 2025. We're also going to refresh the um, the Wirral plan so that it reflects the COVID impact and aligns with those uh, recovery plans. So new performance measures will be developed and hopefully that will enable um, you to have that assurance as a committee um, of how we are achieving our progress towards the delivery of, of, the, um, of, of the key outcomes of the plan. Um, and we'd anticipate we'd see a set of goals and objectives to create a sustainable environment which urgently tackles the env environment emergency as we've spoken about this evening. Um, so further discussions will take place over the next few weeks with the committee and chair and spokes to agree uh, those specific measures that the committee would like to see reported on. So there's just one recommendation in the report that members note the proposals outlined in the report for shaping future performance and that further discussions will take place with the chair and, and group spokes early November so that we can start shaping um, what those reports look like and bring to the next committee. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. I know you've worked really, really hard on um making it more user friendly and uh, the, the dashboards that we've been using during COVID have been really, really helpful. So I think this is a, a move in the right direction will help everybody. Um, does anybody have any comments or questions about that? Um, Councillor Helen Cameron has a hand up and Councillor Chris Cook. Helen? Hi. Um, it was just a, a mention to Nikki that I think it was one of the first conversations we had Nikki about um, information and I think the infographics that you've shared have been brilliant I think you've changed in a very short space of time how information is received and hopefully you've improved how often it's read by making it visually simple and I look forward to developing those KPIs and and how we can use visualizations to report on the progress but and I wonder, because I know your system's limited, how dynamic it could be, um, because what I'd be keen to have is something where you can see the headline figures, you can see commentary on that, but it's a little bit more dynamic and you can click through, even just a hyperlink, you can click through to further information should you want to explore it. So, um, you know, I know you can't build a, a business intelligence tool uh, literally uh, overnight, but it's more about how dynamic we could make it even when it only starts as a picture. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you, 
councillor and I, I do remember that uh, conversation and I, I just, you know, I am a real advocate for making it as user friendly to as many audiences and for our residents and our members and MPs and um, as possible, really. So, yes, we will. We are looking to utilise as much software and this will be very iterative. Um, so, you know, uh, what we have today that, you know, over the next few months won't we'll just evolve and develop just as the dashboard has done from what we started producing in March to what to what we have now and 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 going forward so yes uh, understand and you know would very much agree with working with this committee on looking at dynamic data sets and also the you know the software we have now or we could look to procure to enable um the information you need to 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 you know have to um undertake your roles really um on this committee so yes happy to support and and look forward to working with you all on that thanks nikki chris did you have a point uh yes yes um i completely agree with uh, councillor cameron's um comments there about how useful these are um uh, just one little point I would make a plea really um, when I was on the children's committee uh, last year occasionally some of the uh, dashboards uh, with all the tables and so on were, were quite difficult to follow uh, because you couldn't really see a whole page you know all the columns if you like uh, for a particular page on the screen at once you, you can home in on with the uh, splendid uh, laptops that we've got service pro you know you can you can you can expand can't you on particular cons but it's, it's very hard to be able to read all the data at once on a particular page so i suppose the plea might also be to uh to not include um information which is strictly um peripheral if you like to the main thrust of what the data is trying to tell us you know no, 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 not too much data <laughs> okay thanks thanks councillor cook did anybody else have a point helen your hand is up is that from before or new point sorry no it's legacy okay thanks anybody else got any questions okay i'll take that as a no um, are we okay to move this then? Are we okay to agree the recommendations as in the report? Chair, again, can I just confirm that that's seconded? <coughs> Councillor Fawkes has seconded it. So if everyone's happy to agree, that can be taken by assent. Yes. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you. Can I, Vicky, can I suggest now that we've been going for <coughs> nearly two hours, can I suggest that we have a comfort break? Yes, Chair, under our new standing orders, they do say that after an hour and a half, uh, consideration should be given to a short comfort break. So are we saying five minutes? If the committee, the, I think standing orders say ten, but if the committee yeah. would like to reduce it to five, I'm sure. Ten minutes is fine by me. What does everyone else say? Is that okay? Uh, well, whatever, five, five or ten, five preferably, maybe, I don't know. So if we, if we resume at... Um, five minutes past eight because it's now 7.59. That gives people six minutes. Mm. Okay, good compromise. Thanks, Vicky. Okay, yeah, I'm going to say some more, but go on. Thank How you. big are your houses? How big are your houses?
Welcome back. Thank you. Um, we're up to item nine. A lot more provision scrutiny with you. Page 91 to 128. And this was a, a really important, really quite big and an important piece of work by um, the Environment Scrutiny Committee uh, earlier in the year before lockdown. And Tom, who was leading the committee, is not here. But Christina did a, a lot of work on this. And so, Christina, you're going to talk us through, is that right? Yes, I am. I've, I've, uh, I've, I'll be here, but I'm, I'm going on to my screen uh, now. OK, I'll read out <coughs> what the, the summary of it. Uh, the Task and Finish Group was requested by members of the Environment Overview and Scrutiny Committee as members identified the need for a further review of the provision of allotment sites across the borough, specifically looking at capacity and demand as well as key areas of improvement. There have been a number of studies around the benefits of maintaining allotments for individuals with notable improvements in health and well-being, which is very important at this time, as well as increasing social interaction, educational and vocational benefits. Members met remotely with stakeholders from Wirral Allotment Society and Wirral Site Secretaries, as well as senior officers from the Parks and Countryside team. The key discussions were around engagement with registered providers, collaboration under the local plan with developers, use of existing land, dialogue with partners um, such as Magenta to work together to bring back previous allotment land that had fallen into disuse over a number of years, allocation process and the teams which support this, review of charges, provision for disability allotments, putting in place a robust system for bidding for external grants and funding, and continue the work to make allotments accessible to all. We strive to create a, com a community allotments that are fully accessible and adapted to the needs of all. We also uh, endorse the recommendations from Dave Morris, the chair of the Wirral Allotment Society, which were tightening and improving of the current system relating to non-compliant plot holders. Uh, that's those who have to get issued with the notice, uh, a dirty plot notice. Speeding up the system for new tenant allocation, which can take years in some of the um, some areas. Auditing the waiting list more regularly to ensure applicants still hold an interest because it found that people got to the top of the list and had long since gone somewhere else. Identifying council sites to expand, developing more links with the council's health agenda to reduce health inequalities across the borough. Further autonomy for allotment site secretaries with a trial of self-management to be encouraged. I think there are a couple of um, sites where this is going on very well uh, because it's, it's generally recognised that the site secretaries know an awful lot about the sites. Also invited to the sessions were the acting chair of Wirral Sites uh, Secretaries, that was Professor Ronald Jones and Dave Morris, the chair of Wirral Allotment Society. They highlighted issues of capacity and demand and, and also communication and engagement issues with the council. Findings from this review focused on improving communications with site secretaries and allotment users, increased autonomy for site secretaries, etc., etc., um, allocation of land, targeting extra plots, opening discussions with developments on requirements under law to provide allotment space for new developments. It was the view of the group that we need to move as quickly as possible on all the recommendations for a host of reasons. We were mindful that some of the proposals in the plan had been looked at but not acted on up to this time. And this needed to be done as a matter of urgency, particularly around the extra land which had been identified, because this had been identified up to two years ago, but sites were still unusable and unfenced. Um, applying for external funding, uh, we also felt was extremely important because it would limit the financial implications. A lot of what we looked at was with a view to increasing not just people's ability to get a, a, an allotment, but also in providing f uh, funding via the allotments to almost at, at some at some point in the future, making them self um, self financing. Um, we also looked at uh, division of plots, which we thought were very 
um, very useful uh, thing to look at because some of the plots are enormous, easily split into two. And that was basically um, what we discussed. And I'd like to thank everybody who took part in those uh, meetings um, because not all those people are on environment now. But we worked very hard and I think there was very little dissension amongst us as to what was needed to be done. And we all appreciated that at this time now with COVID, it's absolutely vital that we start providing more in the way of allotments and we ensure that the legal requirements under the local plan and developments are going to be met. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. That was really useful, um, really helpful. Does anybody have any questions about that? No questions. The recommendations in the original report, I think there's five original recommendations. Um, and there's a recommendation in this particular report uh, that we approve the recommendations in the in the scrutiny report um, and determine what actions are to be taken, if any, in the light of the recommendations. Has anybody got any comments to make about that recommendation? Is everybody happy to agree the recommendation? Agree. Can I, sorry, every, yeah, can I, sorry, I, 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 I can I ask if, if if we if it's in agreement with the committee that we accept those recommendations that we have an update at every um, future meeting of this committee so that things aren't left to drift as they seem to have been done. A little bit in the past and that we also have a look at the new initiatives uh, just to check that they're working well. To have, um, to have regular updates, so to agree the, commit, the um, committee recommendation but also the report recommendation and to have regular updates to this committee. Agreed. Chair, I think Councillor Cook has his hand up. Sorry, Chris. Chris, you're muted. Okay. Sorry, I was having difficulty on muting myself then. Um, so you hadn't missed me. It was a, a an afterthought. It's just the the consideration that was given to um, possibly raising the. I know it's not popular talking about raising the fees for plots, but uh, I did mention I was only in two of the. Uh, you know the last two of the working group meetings um but uh the the current fee i think is 65 pounds annually for a full a very large plot and 32.50 for a half lot and i think that you know the majority of residents would be uh, quite happy to pay a bit more um albeit perhaps a slightly more enhanced service um and um you know i don't think we should, should shy away from looking into that now i know that one of the recommendations is to do a bit of research on that but I don't want that research I think as uh, council must perhaps suggested you know we don't want that to be kicked into the long grass and only come back in a year's time you know I think that this is a, an income generation opportunity for the council and I think it's one that the residents who benefit from the allotments uh, would be quite happy to go along with you know and don't forget that these allotments for most people are actually producing food you know which is therefore that <clears throat> offsets uh, the the actual cost of the rental Thank you. Chair, can I say that that was a recommendation of, of the um, the group that we that we look at it because I don't think it's been looked at for quite a long time. Yeah. And and as Chris says, I think I think ours is 68. I'm not sure. Uh, I think it, it needs to be brought in line uh, without being excessive, um, because we do get a tremendous service from the uh, council officers who look who oversee everything on the allotments. Thanks, yes. So that, that's one of the original recommendations that we're supposed to be approving tonight, yes. Councillor Norbury. Yeah, I, I just thank um, the, this, the, the subcommittee. It was, it was um, scrutiny, wasn't it, that this is uh, rolled over from um, for for the great work that he did with that. And it's, it was really uh, refreshing to read, read the report and have a spotlight 
really on allotments, which is which are a massive part of our health and well-being. Uh, introduced, I think it was in 1925, um, the, the last um, law making them statutory requirement for the for the council to um, to operate. Yeah, I think it's important uh, with the with the budget pressures that um, we move uh, as as quickly as possible to making allotments wash their own face, shall we say. Um, but I think there's innovative things we can do, um, and and I think some of them are in in embedded into, into the into report. But I'm particularly um, aware of uh, people with disabilities um, and communities with all needs using allotments. So I was wondering if um, it was possible, because I know I was allotment holder in uh, the one at the back of Fulton Road, Borough Road, up in Prenton there, and we had a community allotment. So one of the allotments was a community allotment that the whole um, community could could use, you know, as a multi-purpose allotment with raised beds and, and access to, to the allotment. So I just um, take on, on board Chris's point and what have you, but I don't want to um, exclude anyone. Um, from using the allotments, any of any the communities which may be socially or financially uh, challenged. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Tony. They're both both very important points. Um, I, I I believe that they, these points have been raised within the original report. So, Vicky. Yes, sorry, sorry, sir, Chair. I was just going to say that uh, Councillor Must Pratt had moved something, and was that seconded? And but if you have some further comments to make, I'll wait. <laughs> I was I was simply just going to say that I'm a big fan of allotments. Um, in fact, the only reason I had an allotment and the only reason I gave one up was because of the car travel involved. Because um, people in some parts of the borough have to travel such a distance to get to their allotments that it can be counterproductive in many ways but they if we get it right and we find allotments in the right places and they are accessible to everybody um we'll be going a long way to improving people's physical and mental well-being and um improving the environment as well i really rate this piece of work very highly um and, and i personally support the recommendations sorry Jeff, can i just say that that's one of the reasons why we mentioned magenta because a lot of those estates that were built in um possibly the 20s, early 30s, all had provision for allotments for every tenant. And when uh, Magenta, did we give or whatever happened with Magenta, uh, all that land, a lot of those allotments weren't used because they weren't popular. Um, now that they are popular, it would seem it, it would seem that we a good idea if we ask Magenta for that land that they don't use. And an example is from a group of residents with those. I think it's either Bedford Road or Bedford Drive that backs onto um, Edgerton Park. There's a whole swathe of land which is landlocked, which is just full of brambles and possibly vermin behind their houses. And they would love to see those back as as allotments and a community allotment, as, as Councillor Norbury said. And this sort of thing would, would would be so good in all sorts of ways because older people would be able to have small plots but have the social life. People, as has, has been said, would be able to cook, have their own food like I have. Um, and the whole thing of being out and physically doing work and children um, joining in, if, if you saw... The programme on um, Northwest tonight, um, they were actually on uh, Bebbington Road allotments and there were various people saying why they had the allotments. And it was so lovely to see a lady who hadn't got a garden and her children and she had made their allotment into a garden, flowers and vegetables. And it was so nice to see that I think it's something we we really, for the for the well-being of all our residents, we need to push very hard on. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. That's why it is, like I said, a really important piece of work that we've got here. Um, so are we ready to agree this? I think Councillor Cook has his hand back up, Chair. Councillor Cook. Sorry, yes, I, I just wanted to stress the importance of, uh, you know, allowing for the provision of um, allotments at whatever ratio is recommended, 20 per thousand households, I would say at least, uh, for new houses as well, considering we've got such a major regeneration project, you know, going on particularly in the less, the more deprived parts of the borough, shall we say, yeah. Thank you. 
Thanks, Councillor Cook. Any other comments? Come on. I don't think anybody else has their hand up, Chair. So could we agree this then? Councillor Must Pratt moves something. Um, am I correct in assuming you've seconded that, Chair? Yes. And I think a number of people have confirmed their agreement in the chat box. So I think we can take that as assent. Brilliant. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you. Which takes us on to, I believe, item number 10 in the agenda pack, which is the Environment Climate Emergency and Transport Committee Work Programme update, which is on pages 129 to 140. Um, and before inviting any questions or comments about this, since the agenda was published, there have been items added at a, um, an agenda setting meeting for future um, future meetings of this committee. So the work program actually has uh, slightly more on it than is, is, I believe has been published. So we've also we've got added to the list. We have um, road safety, grass verges parking charges and we're looking at Hoy Lake Beach as well. So just to confirm that there are additions to the published material. Um, any questions or, or comments about the work programme? Councillor Cameron has a hand up, Chair. Yep. Helen? Hi, yes, I haven't seen the new um, extended list, but I haven't heard anything apart from the dog fouling, the PSPOs about um, litter and um, you know, it's it's more of a concern to me now than ever. Um, you know, we all see, and I see lots of people in my ward going for a walk, taking a bag and collecting whatever they can. And I mean, they don't necessarily Instagram it. It's not necessarily on Facebook. They've just always done it for decades. But now they're picking up masks and it really worries me. I really want to see on this work programme something around um litter in general street cleansing and particularly where it goes and how we can tell people where it goes um if it is recycled or not it's it just it's part of our remit and it doesn't feature anywhere thanks that's an important point um christina have you got your hand up yes it's just while we've got the um the officers with us i'd like to ask a question on the grass verges um on i'd there are various places we'd asked for things not to be cut and one of the places that we asked people asked for was the roundabout at Clatterbridge which thank you very much hasn't been done but I noticed that there's a sign on there which says this, this is a non-grass cutting area and it kind of explains as you zip past why they're not cutting the grass and I wondered has that been put on by the council or has it been put on by a, a helpful resident because if it's put on by the council, there are so many other places where we could put those on to explain why we've not cut the grass, which would alleviate us having emails from people either for or against it, um, because they would at least know that it wasn't that we just hadn't got round to cutting it. Thanks. Can I step in there? Because I was part of that, uh, the, the, the decision to put those signs up. Thanks, Thanks Christina. Um, as has already been said earlier on, this year with the grass cutting regime it was it was um quite probably it was incredibly difficult really problematic for officers and for the people on the ground um because of the covid lockdown and people isolating and being short staffed and um there were a whole host of, of different reasons why it wasn't a normal year for grass cutting and in the process there were verges that were left we, we had a program a pollinators program where we had certain areas where we were going to leave deliberately for um, pollinating insects but there were many many verges that were left inadvertently um, and where wildflowers were spotted and where residents became rather attached to the to the long grass and the wildflowers and so we decided to put signs up but it didn't it wasn't it wasn't really on time it, it didn't happen right from the start so it was sort of um, mid-season really um, and so in some cases we, we didn't really get it right and in some cases it was it was really very very popular but those those signs could be rolled out from the start if we had a proper plan before the season starts and we decided where we were going to put them, I think it would be really, really effective because they did seem to be very popular. Wherever they went up, there was a lot of very positive feedback. Has anybody else got anything to say about that? I think Councillor Cox wanted to speak, Chair, and then Councillor Wright. Tony? Uh, well, I'll, I'll defer to uh, uh, Councillor Wright first. I think we might be about to say the same thing anyway, to be honest. Alison? Is 
Did Councillor Wright want to speak? So Sorry. It's very difficult to unmute my uh, microphone here. I do apologise, Chair. Um, I just wanted to mention, I'm so, sorry, I'm going to mention it here. I didn't make it before. Um, uh, we, we accepted the proposal. Um, but uh, I'm really pleased the interest, in the interest of the cross-party working, it's important that we have seven members on the Climate Emergency Policy Working Group. I think that's a really good thing. But I just wanted to mention, would it be possible uh, to bring the uh, beach maintenance um, onto the agenda, say for the December meeting, please? I know you did mention it was going to be later, but it, it, is, it does need to be fully debated and we would appreciate if it could be brought forward because, as you know, there is going to be um, the, 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 the actual existing agreement, the current, current agreement, managing agreement at the moment is to, is to expire um, early on in the year and uh, we just want to make sure that we debate this important issue that is so important to many members of our community. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, in, in your absence, uh, I think in the first part of the agenda setting meeting that um, that you couldn't make, I did I did um, stress that, that that had been put forward and that, that we wanted to get Hoylake Beach uh, maintenance plan on the agenda as soon as possible. Um, and I believe that um, officers have suggested that we debate it and discuss it February. Um, is David here to, to clarify that? And I believe it was because the officers want time to... Um, to, to put the selection of options on the table for us uh, and, and you know get that done properly and then we can discuss and debate but if uh, Nikki or David want to clarify that I think we did suggest February but if, you know we can bring something earlier if it's needed um, I think we were thinking about that every, everybody seems to accept the need and, and has agreed which is good to, to do consultation locally and it was just to do that and bring that back but we can we can bring I think I said at the I think I said at the meeting it probably needs to come both it isn't an either or because I think it is a big issue we've got to progress it through because the agreement ends in March so it probably isn't an either or we can bring I don't know Nikki will need to confirm it but we could bring something in December that acts as a starting point for that debate and says where things are up to and then it could come back that was my idea at the briefing meeting thank you well, thank you. Thank you. I wasn't able to do it because the computer wasn't working, but thank you very much. If you could bring it forward, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Chair, I can, I can see that Collins put his hand up as well to actually speak. What I was going to say was that December will be ideal. It might be tight when you're talking about consultation. Yes, I, I, I appreciate that, um, especially in the run into Christmas. However, um, if 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 the if if um, broad recommendations were brought in December and they were not found to be palatable um, to uh, members, it would give opportunity to give direction to officers for them to uh, rethink what their um, uh, uh, guidance would be on that particular topic. Because it, February is just too late. As simple as that. If come February, we're going to be deep into talks with Natural England as to what we can and can't do, uh, and what we would like to do and what they would like to see us do. Um, and uh, it, it, it will it will literally time out the, the, the current agreement if we allow it to run until uh, February. So December as the starting point will be ideal. OK, yeah, I, I, I am in agreement with with both of you. So does Colin want to comment on that? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm really sorry about that. I had a couple of problems with teams, so I've missed some of the debate. I'm just picking it up. It's just to provide some assurance to uh, to the chair. The team have been working on this. We've been getting going out to tender for geomorphical studies and things. Um, so we would be able to bring a report, an update report to members for December on what the officers have um, have been to. So if that's any help, Chair. I'm sorry I've missed some of the discussion. So if that's not what you're after, please forgive me. No, no, uh, no that's what we wanted to know. We wanted to know if there was time for the public engagement that uh, Natural England have been calling for um, and time for officers to get some kind of a, a beginner report, a, you know, a first draft report for the December meeting. So you're suggesting that there is time to do that. Uh, uh, absolutely, Chair. We, we could uh, bring you up to speed exactly what we're up to with some um, uh, with some items for discussion with the uh, with the committee. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, Chris, have you got something to say? Uh, yes, just very yeah, just very briefly for the benefits of people who have tuned into this. Um, uh, you answered this question to my satisfaction last time that the agenda setting, I think it was. 
Um, it's just a, in the table, quite long table that sets out the uh, work program. Um, the uh, the road safety um, uh, update item is, is towards the bottom, and, and my initial reaction was to, to 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 think that that was perhaps you know uh, less important, perceived as less important, but in fact. Uh, just wanted to ascertain that that is in fact not the case. It's, it just happened to be added late on in the day that it, it, it's not been deprioritised, if there is such a word. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. Um, I'll bring Simon in in a minute. But my understanding is that the work programme is, is is often just as people add it, and then it's drawn yeah. from according to you know strict timetabling needs, and and um, so it's not necessarily in order of in in order chronological order of work. Um, can I ask Simon just to quickly clarify that that the road safety isn't at the bottom of the list of things to do? Because I know that we said at the agenda setting that there would be um, workshops that we, that councillors could take part in to help shape the new action plan for road safety. And so it is it is an important piece of work, isn't it, Simon? That's correct, Chair, and it's on the uh, it's on the agenda to come back to your committee on the 1st of February next year. But in the meantime, we will be establishing a working group from this committee in the same way that we're doing with the uh, road safety, uh, with the uh, parking charges. That's great. Thanks, Simon. Councillor Cook, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. I think I was clear about that already. I just wanted people listening to the meeting to be to be clear. That's all. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Does anybody else have any questions? I think Councillor Wright has a hand up, Chair, and oh. Councillor Muspratt. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Vicky. Alison, do you have anything? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. It was just um, a, 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 um, an item that what is missing from the um, the uh, agenda program. Uh, that's something that was mentioned at the initial briefing that we had with Spokes and yourself. Uh, highway panel, and the gentleman raised that, and it isn't on this. Could it? Is it likely to be um, brought forward? He mentioned a highway panel and people that would be um, required to sit on that. Do you know anything about that? Um, yeah, I think the idea is that we're, we are going to be the highway panel because that we we meet, that, that it would be required so seldom and we meet often enough for the committee itself to be the highway panel. Simon, can you just confirm that, please? Certainly, Chair, yeah. So under the, uh, under the scheme of delegation, under the new constitution, where schemes that are already in a programme that's been approved by members have less than 15 objections, that will be a decision for chief officer under the scheme of delegation. But where there are more objections or where, or where chair feels it's necessary, that they will be referred to this committee. And there's no need for a special panel. It only met, I think, once last year and twice the year before. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Christina, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I'm a, a little bit confused um, over Hoylake Beach because when we when we're at the call in, I understood that what we agreed was that we would ask the obviously the residents, people who use the beach from across world, and also experts. But now it's being just said as local, and um, I don't know how local is local because one of the experts we had. Um, lives in Ness. Is that local? Um, and I can't see the point in in us not having the, the full picture to make our decisions because unless you know everything about a thing, you're not going to really make a balanced judgment, are you? That's my view. And I just want clarification on who is actually going to be consulted, please. Thanks, Christina. Um, I think we'd need to before we even begin to look at the Hoylake Beach issue again, I think we'd need to revisit the call-in decision, um, the call-in recommendations, um, and we'd need to address the issue of um, of, of stakeholder involvement um, we, rather than just wing it. That's really got to be, that was, it's such an emotive issue, we've really got to make sure we get it right. And the last time we talked about this was the call-in meeting, so the first port of call would therefore be um, I, I would believe, the recommendations from the call-in meeting. Vicky, have you got anything to add to that from a legal point of view? No, Chair, I think, it, as you say, the call-in um, made some recommendations and the committee need to consider those um, recommendations made by the by the call-in. 
um, and I'm sure officers um, will be able to provide further information for the committee. Um, I think Colin's got his hand up and wants to come in, so he, he perhaps would uh, explain more of the uh, practical side of it than me. Thanks, Vicky. Colin? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Muspratt. Uh, what we've done as officers is work through the actions that came from the call in and the recommendations, and we're systematically working through those. Uh, so we're looking to appoint some geomorphical experts. And what I'd like to bring through is December is exactly where we're up to in working through the, those action lists. Is that is that OK, Chair? Yeah, that, that's great. So December is looking like it's 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 an update and a clarification of where we're up to and, and uh, the progress that we're making. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Chair. That's brilliant. Thanks, Colin. Look forward to that. Um, has anybody got anything else to add to that before we finish? Because that was the last item. So, Chair, I think you will take it that um, you're moving that the members note and accept the work plan with those additions that have been raised by members this evening. I am, yes. Thanks, Vicky. Okay. Is that seconded? Yes. And agreed by assent. Agreed. Okay. Are you, are you seconding that, Councillor Cox? I can second that if no one else has done it. I thought someone would have jumped in by now. Okay, we'll take you as seconding it and we'll take the decisions being made by assent. Thank you, members. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we go, can I just, um, I've just got a comment to make about the uh, reports themselves, which I read through diligently um, with great care. And as ever, I looked at the um, environment and climate impact assessments and they were all done. Um, I felt they were done to a very high standard and I've, I wanted to introduce this and I've, I've been quite frustrated at times that they've not been done to a particularly high standard and I know that Vicky's been pushing this diligently in the background and I just wanted to thank everybody involved all the officers involved in in creating these reports and and, um, and presenting these reports for doing such a good job with the environment and climate um, impact assessments which is such an important part of our decision making now and in the future so I just wanted to put on record my appreciation and my thanks to the officers for all the hard work that they've done but particularly for for that quite challenging task of the environmental um, impact assessment. I really appreciated it and I'm very grateful. Thank you. Um, and at this point, I also wanted to thank everybody for their um, participation in this, uh, to thank the officers and to thank the councillors. So thank you, everybody. That brings us to the end of the meeting. Thank you.